Er, we're talking about the pearl <laughs> pearl. <laughs> we're going to talk about the pearl pearl and the pearl curse. That's right. Wow. Wow. I don't even know Eight. what an accent that is. Here, it's not one. It's, it's just. It's the Ermagerd meme. It's just nonsense. Um, nonsense. Biggest professional failures. That's a fun question. Really, I thought you'd like that one. Well, people keep asking, like, what do you see as the future of the Goulet Pen Company? Like, Brian does not need to be. I don't need futuristic. <laughs> talk about... Let me let me talk about the hardships of the like... old. <laughs> I was like, well, we'll give him an easy one. Oh man, it's, it's it's an interesting one though. Um, I guess if we have time, we can do a hypothetical too. I've got one in the chamber from somebody that I didn't yeah. add in there, but it's... well, let's see if we finish. If we're if we're not at an hour by the end of the Q and A, yeah, then we can sure. throw a hypothetical in there. Cool. It's a pretty simple one. All right, we're two minutes in though, so just so we get a truly accurate. Oh right, yes. Timing of things. All right, you ready to go? Um, I can be in in like two seconds. Okay. Let's All right. Center ourselves. Ready. This is what the karate kid does. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and then he chops the ice. Yeah, because that happens. Yeah. <laughs> right, here we go. Here we go. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 86 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous, and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, I'm gonna try not to be weirded up out by Drew looking at me all funny. Got weird energy with this Trapper Keeper shirt, Drew. I don't know, I had to tone it down last week. The banana was like, okay, I found the line for me. I just felt too ridiculous. I gotta go back to gray. Everybody loved the banana. <laughs> they did love it, but it felt weird. I walked around after we shot the pen cast because I didn't wear it earlier in the day. I just saved it up for you for the pen cast. And then I walked around afterwards and people were like, hey, bananas. <laughs> and I was like, yep, this is weird. Somebody said that's probably not going to help with your kids referring to you as a gorilla. But, you know, no, it definitely feeds right into that. That's why <laughs> it they loved does. it so much, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, in today's show, we're going to be talking about why you should and shouldn't use flex pens. We're gonna talk about the stiffest nibs out there. The instead stirfest of the nerbs. Nerbs. stirfest nerbs. And we're gonna talk about what fountain pen collectors should be called because other people get names like stamp collectors and coin collectors. So we're gonna brainstorm that. Uh, we're gonna be talking about pens from our collection that we rarely use. We're gonna talk about our biggest professional failures. That should be fun. A deep well to pull from there. For me, no, I wasn't picking on Drew, but oh, I've got some. We both got some, yeah. Uh, and we're gonna spotlight the Pilot Prera because we have, you know, felt like it. And we talk about just our lives in the last week, what's been going on. So that's this week, and uh, let's start it off with some feedback. Right, uh, we've been talking about occupations recently. Like, what does everybody mm -hmm. do? What yeah, communities use fountain pens? Who uses fountain pens? Well, um, RJ. Marmaro mm -hmm. or RJM Armaro, I don't know. It's a piece of letters. Works. Says, I'm a plumber and I absolutely absolutely love fountain pens. I spend my day either stopping water where it's not wanted or bringing water to where it is. Very important. I'm fascinated by the engineering required to make fountain pens controlled leak functions so reliably that you can write with it. Yeah, I love that connection yeah. because nobody would understand how a liquid is controlled and, uh, you know, um, regulated yeah. like a plumber would. Yeah. I, I find that fascinating. So I mean, thank you for sharing that with me. As a plumber, aren't you just controlling leaks? It's like human fountain pen. You either want leaks to be happening in a specific way or definitely not, not happening. At all. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So Respect. I really enjoyed that. Respect. And then uh, Dan Eli for Evs says, I can't tell you my level of disappointment when the pen cast video goes up and it's only an hour and 44 <laughs> minutes. Oh I gosh. feel cheated. Oh, come LOL, on. two and a half hours, guys, or it didn't happen. Oh my gosh. Love y'all. Wow. Well, Dan, there was kind of a good reason for that because <laughs> I need to erase the memory card on the camera every time and I forgot to do that. So it filled up 
um, like halfway through the pen cast. So we had nothing. I realized I'm like, oh, Brian, it's not recording. And it's like, oh, crap. Like, so we had, we had oh, to go back. How and, long ago did it stop recording? Right. So we needed to go back and redo a question or two. But um, we didn't know what time we were working with. Normally, we can see how long we've been recording. But that time, since we lost half of it, we're like, we had no idea. We lost our gauge. So I thought it was going to end up being about two and a half hours. It ended up actually being shorter. But we had no concept of how long it had been going. So we just kind of guessed. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was a little shorter, probably. I think we were a little... Uh, nervous that we were going too long because that's usually what happens well and i have like on my computer i have the actual time mm -hmm. and i know that like you have a kid to pick up and i have stuff to we've do stuff too to do. in my life so it's like okay especially when we have a technical hicc hiccup like that it's yeah. like okay we can't just keep it going forever yeah yeah we need it but uh other we do we do appreciate it um, I'm, I'm glad you can't get enough because even still, Rachel, I'm almost on a weekly basis now. It's just like, I don't know why people keep watching this. <laughs> she doesn't even watch it. She's like, why do people watch you for two hours? I don't understand. I was like, I don't understand either, but here we are. We've got lots of friends. <laughs> and then Stacy, speaking of friends, Stacy says, since Drew enjoyed making a word cloud chart of feedback from the Turkey Hammock giveaway, how about doing a survey of everything people are doing while listening to the pencast? Cleaning, handwriting practice, oh, baking, cheesecake seed starting other hobby projects or even just passing time and then creating a word cloud Ooh. well stacy i love that idea and i'm gonna do it so this week in the description i'm going to have another google form it's just going to ask what you up to and then i'm going to go ahead and ask like what your favorite pen is and maybe what your favorite movie or tv is just to see what people are doing out there maybe i'll make a word cloud for all of the pencast listeners watchers favorite movie and just see what the most common movie is favorite movie of all time yeah let's just let's figure out what, what we're all into there's gonna be one there's gonna be one most now, commonly mentioned will the word, movie well the word cloud like with a movie that's tough it needs to be spelled the, titles, the exact same way but the titles can be multiple words right like how does it separate out like how do you know like, i don't know what's, the what's, word in might be like the one it's gonna be messy and sloppy and dumb okay. but it's it, it is of no consequence at all this so is true. it doesn't matter so this is true yeah if we see the word you know um uh, Rocky, I'm just going to assume that it's four. So whatever, whether you want to do the Roman numeral thing or the uh, yeah. number four, I'm just going to assume that if I see Rocky, you're talking about four. Um, I'm just kidding. Every Rocky has its own merits, except for five. Uh, we won't talk about that. I've never seen a Rocky movie. Well, Brian. It's, it's a surprising number of movies that you I find know. iconic that I I've know. never seen. Well, anyway, I will do that. So check the description of yeah. this YouTube video. And if you're an audio listener, uh, go check it out on the YouTubes as well. Indeed. Um, or maybe I'll put it in. I should be able to put it in the uh, show notes of the audio thing as well. So, yeah. Will that yeah. show up as a link? I don't know. I'll try it. Yeah, I think well, so. The whole podcast thing is still a bit mysterious. I put links in there. To us. Yeah. In fact, there's a whole separate section of chapters that I go into so that they're clickable chapters. Hopefully, most podcast cool. apps support that because I it's a little bit of extra work, but oh, well. um, I do it for you people because I love you. There you go. All right. What you got, Brian? Uh, I got Feed some us feedback. Back. David Cool, 5189, says, I'm assuming this is in reference to last week's shirt. Drew has officially driven Brian dot, 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 bananas. Well said, David. Yes. I appreciate there were a the lot dad of, joke. There were a lot of comments about your shirt. Not surprising. Really? Yeah. That's shocking. May or may not have been why I wore it slash bought it. Um, okay. Anna Figuero. Du oh, my gosh. Okay. I was not ready to say this word. Anna Figuero. Du Figuero. There you go. Figuero. Cool name. I can't pronounce it, though. Uh, 4510. Yes. As someone that works in computers all day, I find myself reaching out to analog experiences so much more often than before being in the field. So I was referencing like a surprising number of IT folks. And you said they're on computers all day. Why would they want to be on computers more? Yeah, uh, good to relax my eyes. And it also feels so much easier to put my thoughts out when I do so in a notebook instead of trying to type it. I am vibing with that. I'm vibing with that. Uh, and then Lemon Inspector says, I'm not surprised many IT professionals use fountain pens. We've learned not to trust computers. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure, because all you're doing is dealing with problems and the failures of computers all day. Not to mention the crazy things that bad people can do with them. So if you want to put your own thoughts in a safe place, it's your journal. Mm -hmm. um, and then last one I have is from Poetic Polecat. 
<laughs> these names are just great. Um, Peach had her own game on the DS. This was news to me. There, there are multiple comments about that. So I was talking about Super Nintendo. I was talking about Nintendo franchise and Mario, specifically the Mario universe, and how Peach needs her own time to shine. And apparently she had it, but I missed it. Super Princess Peach was a game for the DS. That's why I missed it, because it was the DS and it came out when I was like graduating college. And oh, it was like even after that, I, I think. Had, I think it came out in 2005 was when it. Oh, wow. Yeah. I definitely wasn't paying attention at that time. Anyway, uh, Pol Poetic Polcat says, I recall it being fun but odd because one of your moves was to cry on plants to make them grow. That is odd. So I actually went on a little mini, little mini deep dive myself and just looked up this game and found some stats on it. And it's actually a pretty highly rated game. Um, though there were some elements of sexism in there as you may yeah. like crying on plants. I looked at that as like, well. There seemed to have like been really? an, an emotion meter. Like, yeah, why they would do that with like the only female lead character, have it's her bit, like go through bit, emotions is... It's a bit sexist. That's a bit, mm-hmm, little, yeah. nah. Yeah. She needs a but, re let's, let, let's give her a redo. But, <laughs> like, have it be a proper platformer that don't utilize but, emotions as her weapon. But the premise of the game is that Mario and, was it Mario and Luigi or Mario and Yoshi? Maybe it was I Mario and Luigi. But they get kidnapped and Peach has to save them. I like that. And I was like, that actually is kind of exactly what I was talking about. So, yeah. great. Now we're going to make my kids want a DS, some vintage thing. Like, my kids already want random because they watch these like, YouTube videos about whatever random game, irregardless of how inconvenient it is to actually play it. And I'm like, we don't have that system and you wanna just play that one game and now you wanna have like five systems? No, this isn't happening. Anyway, uh, that's all I got for feedback. Let's talk about some new stuff. I got some cool new stuff to talk about this week. I like what we have in here. First one is a Pilot Custom 743 and Vera de Gris. That was a big deal. Indeed. Big deal. I mean, we just introduced the 743. Right. Not long ago. It's basically an 823 that's cartridge converter. So if you don't like all the fuss of the vacuum filling, you get all the benefits of the 743. Um, uh, the cartridge converter. So $336 for this pen. This is a US exclusive color. That's why it's a big deal. It is a big deal. We don't often get those. We don't. Like and ever. It's solid color, which also doesn't happen on these. Well, no, the regular 743 is solid color. I'm thinking of the 823 and yeah. the 74. But anyway, um, really nice looking color though. I like this. It's like a like a jade green almost. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more darker. yellow than it. A little darker. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's got the good range of nib sizes, just like our black 743 has. Extra fine, fine, medium, broad, double broad, and Falcon, which is legitimately like I have turned the corner on the Falcon because of the 743. Yeah. I do like it quite a bit. So that's pretty exciting. I already grabbed one for myself. What size? I'm pretty sure I took a Falcon. Yeah. Did I take a Falcon? You should have. Because I took a black Falcon. So I was like, do I need a Falcon for both? Oh, maybe you don't need I think I might double broad. Have, I might have taken a medium instead. A medium? I don't remember, actually. I should know this. Oh. I, I, you haven't inked you know, it up yet? I haven't inked it up. Oh, yeah. It's on my desk right now, but I've had a busy day. Um, anyway, the other pen that I have to talk about is the Twisby Diamond Mini AL in a color. Grape. They haven't done a color... In a, in a while. In a while. It's been a minute. They've yeah. done them before. They have. They did like a mint blue. They've done like the white with rose gold, I think. Yeah, that one I think is still available. Maybe. That one, yeah, that one came out a while ago, yeah. though. But they, they have done a few. They, they never do but them for the that back an, minis. That wasn't an AL, though. The white with rose gold was just a regular mini, I think. I think the AL might just be the mint blue, if I'm not mistaken. I think they... Pow like a powder blue. Yeah, I wouldn't... I'm, I'm, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trust myself okay. or you. Um, really. I wouldn't trust me on these types of details. <laughs> My knowledge of this type of stuff has gotten worse the longer I'm with Rachel. I, she she's so good at everything. It. I'm I like, know. this is this is wasting. I don't space need to remember this. Brain. Yeah. Yep. Except because you know she will. We're in this room, not accessible to yeah. her with a camera in her face. Yay! Well, here um, I'll go over mine, and then you can check and uh, yeah. see. I will stealthily um, check as she was talking. Um, so Tomoe River is back. Uh, we've known that. That company was purchased by another company, and now they're making Tomoe River paper again. We've seen it show up in notebooks here and there, but officially, Tomoe River branded loose leaf paper is now back in our stores, available in 52 gram in the uh, white paper 
A4 and A5 size. So um, I believe there are packs of 100 each. You can grab one of those. Uh, I use the A4 loose leaf pages for my letter writing um, exclusively. They fold up nice and thin. You can get, you know, as far as weight goes, you can pack a ton of Tomoe River sheets in there and it'll still be just as heavy as, you know, a couple normal sheets. So I really like those. And um, yeah, these are going to be uh, $9.95 for the A5, $14.95 for the A4. And um, in my testing, I found them to be quite nice. You know, any differences to the original Tomoe River, I've found to be negligible, but everybody's got their preferences. But uh, to me, I don't really notice a difference in how I've always used them and written with them. So there you have that available now. Also available now is the Aurora 888 Burano. And this is a really nice looking pen. It has an acrylic that is very reminiscent of the marshmallow acrylic that we've seen come out of Estherbrook uh, a couple times now. Um, it's up there at $805.50, but um, it's not going it's to be around forever. Cents. That puts it over the top. I know. I was going to get one for 805 but yeah. then I just, it's not in the budget for me. cut it off somewhere. Cents, yeah. uh, really nice packaging too, Brian. Remember how Aurora used to have that kind of matte sort of yeah. black box that kind of mm -hmm. always would get kind of scuffed and smudgy. Oh, yeah. This one is a heavily lacquered black wood box. Mm. with It's just a really nice fit and finish. Like I was a shiny really, black? Yeah, very glossy. Hmm. I, I really like it. Very nice presentation. One might say piano black. Yeah, yeah, for real. Nice. Definitely piano vibes. So that is available now. You can check it out. At least look at the pictures. It's a really cool looking pen. Very cool. Um, you ready for an answer about this Twisby Mini AL? Yeah, let me know. There has been several colors we've totally forgotten about. Yep, I figured. Um, thankfully, we have a blog post that we wrote of our own Twisby Mini Special Edition history. So in August 2019, there was the Mint Blue Mini AL. That's the one I was thinking of. There was also a AL uh, Mini Gold. Ooh, that's pretty. That is cool looking. Very bright, like yellow gold. Um, and there was a regular blue like a darker blue that was in 2017. And then there was a silver, which is the one that we mentioned before. And then the white and rose gold, that was just a regular mini. That was not an AL. So this is, I guess, technically the f f fourth or fifth different color mini. So I, I thought they hadn't done as many, but they have done several you of know them. You know, they haven't done so, any of like the, uh, the VAC, mini. VAC that, mini. That one is neglected. I would love to see VAC mini. Anyway. Something different. Something different on the Mac bit. Vac Mini would be cool. But, you know, they do a lot of different things, so can't complain. Tozzi puts out a lot of stuff, so. They do. Won't complain too much. All right. You ready for a Q? So you can A? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Q and A. Brian. Drew. Vippersnatch is asking you, <laughs> why should and why shouldn't oh, yelling it. people use flex pens? These are all caps, shoulds, and mm -hmm. shouldn'ts. Um, so a case for and a case against. I think I can do this. I think I'm ready. Go for it. Because I am a debater. You do like to argue with yourself. I'm the Myers-Briggs. I'm yeah. known as the debater. If there's no one else to argue with, you just often argue with yourself. Oh, yeah. If everybody's agreeing on something in the room, I will be the one to be like, well. You said that just today. <laughs> I did. We were talking about a pen and Brian's like, I don't know. I kind of like it now because everybody else doesn't I kinda like, like it. it. I kind of like it more because everybody's <laughs> crapping all over it, you know. Um, yeah, I am an agent of chaos. Uh, this is a good question though, because I feel pretty strongly that flex pens are not for everybody. I don't think everybody needs to love them, uh, but I do think that some people will. So it actually kind of fits right in the vein of the way that I want to address this question. So um, I kind of broke it out into two different parts and I, you know, I came up with this pretty loosely. I'm not making a dissertation here. Um, so you shouldn't use flex pens for the following reasons. Not exhaustive list, but these are the top of mind ones for me. If you think that fountain pens in general are finicky or complicated, flex pens are gonna be even worse in this respect. Yeah. So if you already think that they're a little bit of trouble, don't even they, bother with flex pens. They certainly pens. do not simplify they things. Don't sim they don't simplify things. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you're busy or just an impatient person, you shouldn't use flex pens. It's just not for you. If you are more into the experience of writing and the feel of writing than you are about the final result of what the written words on the page look like, maybe you shouldn't use flex pens mm. because it's satisfying in a way to get the flex result, but it doesn't feel better writing with a flex pen. Like it's gonna feel scratchier. You're gonna have, you're much more beholden yeah. to the way that the pen is gonna perform. Like you 
have to conform to what the pen wants to do, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. So you need to be okay with that and accept that. This is a this is something if you're into like calligraphy with like dip pens and like, you know, spring steel nib, like pen points and stuff like that, that's a whole different thing. That in that world, the the products themselves are not the star. It's the people using them, and it's the end result of what you the get. End result, yeah. So it's all about like getting a nice looking letter, getting your letter form to look really good. The experience of actually doing the writing is actually kind of painful a little bit. Yeah, especially <laughs> with like actual cal- like untipped calligraphy nibs. Oh, the yeah. upstrokes on those are oh, just brutal. It's scratchy and it's now not with fun. fountain pens, it's better because we are it's talking better. tipping material. It is, but it you is. you are not going to get. But it's it's the not, same. Yeah, it's not the it's not it's it's it can be an enjoyable in a different way yeah. because of the result you're getting. Sure, but just in terms of like the feel and just the, the flow and feel, stuff like yeah. that, it's 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 a much more. Oh, I don't know the right word to use. But, you know, there's just there's more of an anxiousness while you're writing because yeah, especially you're, generally you're, you're trying to get so attentive to it. You are generally you are trying to get line variation, which means you're going to get more out of like an extra fine, flexible nib mm-hmm. than you would be a broad, flexible nib because you can get a broad falcon if you wanted to. You can. And that is going to be pretty. That's going to feel nice. Yeah. You're just not going to really get a lot of line gonna, variation. Yeah, exactly. So you can compromise. But really, the more line variation you are after the more fine you're going to get, which means your upstrokes are going to feel very different than your downstrokes if you're using them, yeah. if you're actually engaging the flexitude. And like me personally, when I'm writing, it's like I, I'm i forming the thoughts as I'm writing the words. And flex pens definitely like mess with your flow, it like like the flow of your brain of what you're trying to write. You almost need to kind of like know what it is you're, you're writing before you even get into it because it's going to be it's going to be a less it's going to be more time consuming because you got to slow down when you use flex. But then also like, you know, if it railroads and you got to go back and rewrite a certain letter and something like that, that's not unusual. Um, you know, you're going to be thinking more about that stuff than you will just about the words. So it just, it puts your brain in different, At first, fre- anyway. in different frequency. You could probably get to a point Especially where it's pretty learning. brainless, but yeah. Yeah. Neither but, of us have reached that point. No, definitely not. Um, and then the last point I had was um, if you're not into tinkering and you just want your pen to work, and not be a hassle, then, you know, if you're just not like naturally somebody who's who's good, like with their hands, like tactile, then you're gonna be pretty frustrated with flex pens because you do have to adjust and tweak and, you know, do all these different things. So you might have to adjust your own writing angle or like the, you know, you might have to heat set the feed every now and then, or, you know, if you overspring your tines, you might have to bend them back. There's all kinds of adjustments and things like that that you have to kind of like get used to. Buy an aftermarket feed in a lot of cases. Yeah, there's just, there's a lot of it. The fidget factor is way higher as just a general requirement for flex. Um, Okay, so I've dogged on them pretty hard so far. And that was intentional why I said the shouldn'ts first, because the thing that we've learned from being on the customer service side of flex things, you gotta be really careful when you use the word flex as a retailer, because everybody thinks, oh, I'm gonna be able to do like Spencerian calligraphy easily right out of the box and it's gonna be no trouble. No, that's and anytime we say flex, we're talking about modern flex, which a lot of people will say isn't even flex. But you could argue that as far as what is currently being manufactured, the more flexible of those nibs is what we refer to as flex. Because yeah. vintage flex is a completely different beast. It is, and we're not uh, the most qualified to even speak on nope. all the different variations of it. But um, reasons why you should use them. So if you are into calligraphy or hand lettering or you know something about like the art form of doing that and you know you care more about the end results than you do about like the time or the after the experience of what's required in writing it then yeah you absolutely should look into flex pens especially if you're used to like dip calligraphy and stuff like that flex pens could actually be a step up in terms of ease of use and stuff like that from what you're used to um and it could be a lot of fun especially if you're like wanting to like write some kind of flex calligraphic kind of stuff more on the go you know if you're used to using like dip calligraphy stuff that can be a bit more to like transport somewhere whereas a regular fountain pen you can just have a flex nib in it and you know maybe not get as defined an experience but it could be a good compromise for you it's more flexible it is more (laughs) flexible um if you have a lot of patience and you find the writing practice like the practicing writing to be enjoyable then you have a more dynamic experience doing it. I mean, yeah, you can definitely practice and improve your handwriting and try cursive, different fonts and scripts and stuff like that. 
I don't know why I said fonts, scripts technically if you're writing it. So you can do that with a regular fountain pen for sure, but certainly if you're using things like a stub nib or a flex nib or something like that, that increases your range and your dynamic you know, appeal of the practicing of writing. So if that act is something that's therapeutic or you enjoy that, you like improving your handwriting, it can be a more dynamic tool for accomplishing that. Um, if you have a specific end goal that you're working towards, like if you're trying to letter a bunch of say like invitations to something like a wedding or a, you know, some other major event. Wedding, I think, comes to mind first just because you think of, you know, calligraphy and stuff or some fancy dinner party or something. A soiree. A soiree, a murder mystery game, and you want to include calligraphy in there somehow. Um, you know, having like a defined goal of something to practice towards can be kind of fun. Um, or maybe if you're into like bullet journaling or, you know, just writing nice headers or something in your your scrapbooks or things like that. Yeah. That can be fun because you're trying, again, it's not as much about the writing practice itself, but the end result of what you're getting, um, that can be an enjoyable to kind of work towards that. Um, if you're pretty good with your hands, okay with tinkering and troubleshooting, you like to kind of fiddle with stuff, flex pens can be a lot of fun just in terms of the different things that you can do. You can try tweaking them. If you're into messing around with nibs and grinding them, you can try scooping out the wings and adding your own flex and you can do some crazy stuff um, that can get pretty fun. Um, and if you're into vintage pens, just in general, this is a very deep rabbit hole that you can do, but there's, you know, most of the, you know, if you're, a, if you're a real flex enthusiast, you will think back to the days of old as being the more true, more whatever, um, OG flex pens. Um, there's certainly like historical pens and, and well-known flex nibs that aren't made anymore. Um, and you get into the whole collection aspect of it too. So if you're really into that, that vintage aspect of it, um, flex pens can be a great way to kind of dive deeper into that. So I'm personally never going to hard sell anybody on getting into flex pens. I think most people are naturally curious enough and want to do it anyway. So um, I will say the experience is mostly an exercise in frustration for pretty much most people involved. Um, but if you're into it and you find it appealing, then you know there's just some hurdles and it's going to take some practice, but it can be very rewarding. Um, flex pens require you to have basically all the basics of fountain pen use down plus all this other stuff you need for flex. So it's not something that I'm necessarily like, oh, you should try a flex pen as your first pen. I'm like, Ugh. that's like a lot. You know, that's like saying like, oh, you just learned how to drive. You should buy a kit car and assemble it yourself and then drive it. I'm like, Ugh. that's probably not the best intro. No. no, thank you. Yeah, so there you go. I would add on to that and say that you don't actually have to flex a lot if you did want to buy a pen that has a so-called flexible or soft nib. That's true. If you wanted to, like if you, you could be neither one of those people that is really after, like for or against flex. If you wanted to buy, say, a Falcon, a Pilot Falcon, which is one of the best fountain pens on the market, bar none, mm -hmm. and you just wanted to write with it totally normal, you absolutely can and you will have a mm -hmm. great time because it is a little bouncy, it is very comfortable, and there are no rules that say you have to push that thing any harder than it takes to just write something. It's true. So you can absolutely enjoy a bouncy nib writing completely conventional without trying to get any line variation and have a great time. I still think the Falcon is a great choice for someone who just wants a very comfortable writing experience. It's a lightweight pen. It's a nice bouncy nib, and it's super enjoyable. For that matter, the Diplomat Magnum is one that we've talked about mm -hmm. um, as having a shockingly bouncy yeah. steel nib. Not a flex nib by any no, stretch of the imagination. Advertises flex. It's Absolutely not, yeah. not. But it does provide you a little bit of a bounce. So yeah. um, that is pretty much what you're getting with modern flex nib anyway. They're yeah. soft, bouncy nibs rather than true flex nibs. And, you know, a, a lot of people would say. But uh, you can absolutely enjoy that just mm -hmm. feeling of a softer nib without going for flex. The options are always there, but that's true. It's a good way to kind of flirt with it. If you don't want to go like whole hog into the flex world, yeah. getting a soft nib like a Falcon or like an E95S or mm -hmm. something like that can be a good way. You're going to get a great pen that you can enjoy certainly just regularly. But then if you want to try the line variation thing, it's there for you. Yeah. I would say it's more there for you to do line variation with the Falcon than the E95S. True, um, true. That's more like just the bounce. The Falcon is bounce or line variation, I'd say. Yeah, the Falcon, the, the, they make a hard 
nib, like a normal nib version yes. of the Falcon, which they don't, I don't even know if they import that I into the US. I don't think they do. I think they only import the soft nib. So that's where you do get some flexibility. It's not technically a flex nib. They don't call it flex, it's called soft. Yeah. But it's it's kind of known as one of the more reliable, better, you know, especially in the gold nib world. Um, but yeah, the Falcon is a great way to flirt with it. And that was one of my first ones too. Yeah, give me, can't give go me wrong a good with sense of it. Yeah. All right, Drew, I got a question for you from Jay. You, apparently you specifically drew. I'm just kidding. He just says you. Talk a lot about how soft different nibs are. I guess and we kind of just did. Just talk yeah. about it. Good segue. Um, gold, flex, etc. But what are the stiffest nibs out there? Are they still enjoyable to write with? Why don't fountain pens work to write on receipts? Is there an ink that does work on them? You got a four in one here with Jay. Okay. Jay. Let's get down to it. Uh, so just going bit by bit here, stiff, stiffest nibs out there. Uh, first one that comes to my mind is the Platinum Preppy. It's a really well-known pen with an absolute nail of a nib. Like, And nobody will say that this nib is anything but super rigid. Yeah. Um, it just is. Fair. It's the shape of the nib. It's a very stocky nib, very stout nib. And it is really wrapped around that feed. So a lot of nibs um, kind of bounce up and down because they're not really connected to the feet and they can do that. A nib like the preppy nib is literally wrapped around the feet. So it's got nowhere to go and yeah. it doesn't go anywhere. It is a freaking nail. Yeah. So that thing is rigid. It's as... like a, it's like a U channel beam that yes. you would use to like build a bridge. <laughs> exactly. Like it's like squared off and reinforced yeah. to be like structurally sound. That thing isn't going anywhere. <laughs> and by that same logic, the Lamy nibs are usually pretty stiff as well. The steel nibs anyway, um, because they do that same thing. They're very short nibs, so they mm -hmm. don't have a lot of, yeah. you know, um, whatever physics term. Leverage. I, I guess leverage, yeah. yeah. Leverage. Um, they don't have that going for it. And they also do wrap around the mm -hmm. feed. So they are connected to the feed in ways that most nibs are not connected to the feed. Most nibs just kind of lay on top, sometimes in a little channel, sometimes, you know, just on top. But these two nibs, the Preppy and the Lamy nibs, they literally are clamped onto it. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very connected to the feed, which... With, with the exception of the Lamy 14 karat gold nibs, mm -hmm. they're they're that same shape, but the material itself is softer. They so are you bouncier. do get some yeah. bounce, but you're, it's not flexing by any means. No, no. It just doesn't feel like a rigid nail. Yeah. So um, as far as gold nibs go, um, the Lamy nib is on the stiffer side of gold nibs. It's, it it's still got a little, it's got it a little bit of... It, yeah, it's definitely got more bounce yeah. than the steel nib, but yeah. um, I would, the first... You know, uh, in stiffness, gold nib that pops into my mind is the Platinum 3776. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very flat nib. It's a very rigid nib in my experience. Yeah. Um, it's thick too. Like the amount of gold they use in that nib apparently is higher than most other nibs. And so it's a very stiff. They, they actually design it to be a pretty stiff nib. Yeah, so it definitely is. And to answer the second part of your question, are they enjoyable to write with? Absolutely. The, prep, the preppy is immensely enjoyable to write with. Yes, it's a nail, but it is a consistently writing nail. It doesn't dry out well at like it, it stays it's a reliable up. Nail. It really is. It's, <laughs> it's a very true. reliable nail. It's true. It's sturdy. It writes for you every time. It's tried and true. And that's why it's probably the most like it's probably one of the fountain pens. It's probably the Japanese fountain pen that's gotten into the hands of the most people. Like probably I mean especially because the price is yeah. so low. Yeah. So I would say like it's 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 out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a pretty easy argument. Yeah. So definitely easy to write with. And the Lamy, of course, easy to write with. Um, mm -hmm. Probably not as consistency in, as consistent in nib size as the Preppy is, mm -hmm. but as far as performance go, sure. And the amount of ease that the Lamy nibs possess in the ability to switch mm -hmm. them out and enjoy different sorts of writing experiences. I'd be remiss to say too, speaking about Lamy, because they have their regular 14 karat nibs that's the same like shape and everything is interchangeable with you know, like they have those on some of the studios mm -hmm. and CP1 and stuff like that. The one on the Lamy 2000 that we talk about so much, punch your bingo card, um, that one is also a 14 karat gold nib, but it's a different design than totally. all the rest of the pens. That that nib is stiff. It's there pretty is stiff, like, yeah. There is very little balance to that thing. Yeah. So that that's an example of a, generally I like nibs that are a little bouncier, 
but the Lamy 2000 is one that it's just so tiny. I don't look for that. Yeah, yeah. I don't look for that in this. Yeah. Thing. So yeah, definitely easy to write with the Platinum Preppy and the Lamy um, Safari All Star. Any of those Lamy nibs, mm -hmm. great experiences. And the Platinum 3776 as well. It's not my cup of tea. It's actually one of my least favorite nibs, but it is a lot of people's favorite nib. And you, there are people that say it's the best gold nib out there. It's not my preference, but it obviously has its fans. So mm -hmm. a lot of people love that nib. So it's a good nib. Yeah. I like it. Um, absolutely pleasurable to write with all yeah. of these. And I will say they have some, it's not that many pens, but they do have 3776s sometimes that have a soft nib mm -hmm. on it. That feels more like a regular like pilot right. kind of bouncy nib. Yeah. Those, I'm like, I'll use the regular platinum nib and I'm like, yeah, this is a good nib. And then I use the soft one. I'm like, yeah, I like this better. That's how it should be. But yeah. they're all good. They're I do like good. that nib. Yeah. I do like that nib. Um, and then receipt paper. I found this one interesting because mm. I have been guilty in the past of saying like, hey, you know what? Sometimes fountain pens aren't the thing. You know, grab a Retro 51 if you need to sign your receipts. And I was like, you know what? I can't remember the last time I actually used a fountain pen on some receipts. So mm. I went out into my car the other day after I got this question uh -huh. and I grabbed a bunch of uh, receipts that just Probably I was keeping Waffle intentionally. House, Bojangles, Taco Bell. I'm just throwing ideas out Did there. you read this already? Maybe. No, I didn't. I'm just literally... Thinking of what receipts that you would have shoved in your car. Wendy's, Bojangles, <laughs> Lowe's, and Duncan. Okay. In the vein. In the vein. So no Taco Bell. No Taco Shady Bell. keeps saying no to Taco Bell. Like, I'm going to have to go there by myself. No. Uh, but yes, not getting Bojangle, easier on, it's Bojangles not getting easier was on, on your there. bodies. I'll say that. Bojangles was on there. But anyway, I, 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 was, I brought them all in. I'm like, I'm going to write on these. All right. So I can say right now, the three pens I have inked up are all Monteverde inks. I have Scotch Brown, Brown Sugar, and uh, this green. Um, Yosemite Green. And it wrote fine. Like all yeah. of them wrote fine on both sides, hmm. even on the slick side. And they actually all dried pretty quick too. Really? Yeah. So I've got no complaints. Like I think that, you know, by, this what is nip, all, What nib size is you working with on We've pens? got an extra fine Lamy 2000 that actually writes kind of wet. Um, we've okay. got a Bennu with a um, medium something. Oh. I don't know. It's a medium. That's pretty... Yeah, I mean, it's that's pretty, that's that's not a and then, thin nib. And then I've got a uh, Mirage Mythos with uh, medium. That's medium. Okay, so that one's probably fine. That one's probably medium. Okay. But yeah, I mean, they're putting out I mean, some they're ink. not stingy. No, they're not stingy. Hmm. And they all wrote just fine. I mean, they didn't look amazing, but they kept their color just fine. Yeah. So I would say you might be fine writing on receipt paper with a fountain pen. It might not give you the trouble that you think it might give you. It, it's probably tough because like, that's not what the receipts are necessarily like designed around. No, no, no. So I can imagine the experience being wildly inconsistent from like one restaurant to another or. I mean, there's four right another. here. <laughs> you never know. I mean, I, I get, <laughs> who knows? I, I did a short, a small study myself and I found no problems. So if you have a particular store that just it does not have. Now, to be fair, you don't need to sign these receipts because these are from fast food places. <laughs> well, so. You know, I'll I'll bring one with me to the restaurant next time I you know okay. you know need to dine out. But I mean, to get to get a little more into like the science of why it may not work as consistently, it's because these receipts they're using thermal paper, yeah, which is like got a like a waxier kind of substance to it. It's not even necessarily even made to write on. Like ballpoint pens don't even write that great on this paper, generally no, speaking. No. So that's not what they're designed for. They're designed so that when you heat them up with a laser, they print and show text on it. That's pretty much what it is. Yep. So and yeah. you you the, that waxy coating might get up in your tines too. So probably yeah, not. if you're writing it on the I wouldn't if you like, do it a lot. I wouldn't do a NaNoWriMo challenge on receipt paper necessarily, but <laughs> if that's all one. you got and you want to show off your pen in yeah. front of somebody over a fancy dinner, go for it. Give it a shot. Go for it. Nothing bad's going to happen. Yeah. I don't know about nothing. Like you what, might What could possibly happen? You could spend a lot at a restaurant. I'm not going to be held accountable for that. No, that has nothing to do with the pen you sign. Well, food poisoning. You've already spent the It's not my fault. You've already spent the money at the point that you're signing it with your pen. Anyway, all right, Drew. Yeah. Question number three from Next. Alan mm -hmm. says, Dear Brian and Drew, a stamp collector is called a philateist, mm -hmm. philatelist, philatelist. <laughs> a coin collector is called a numismatist. What mm. is a fountain pen collector called? Great question. I did a little research on this to little avail, unfortunately. That's fine. It means we get to make up our own. We do. Um, I don't believe that there is a specific definition for a pen collector, but my online research brings up the term stylophile. Oh yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, um, breaking it down a little bit. 
stylus, I don't know if I pronounce that right, in Latin, meaning stake, or stylo in Greek, meaning pillar. Mm. The term started being used for writing instrument as a stylus around the early 1800s. And then you have phyllus, no, sorry, phyllus in Latin, or philo in Greek, means love. So stylophile would essentially mean one who loves writing instruments. Mm. Or maybe you just love pillars that also could could apply. Mm. Um not specific to fountain pens. Mm. So fountain pen, a fountain pen in general is a relatively, you know, that didn't exist in, you know, ancient Greek or Latin times. So we're not really able to derive that specificity out of an yeah. ancient language. But, you know, my question, though, was, you know, you have, what is it, philatelist and a numismatist? Mm -hmm. But though that's like, that's like so these are like collectors and technically i think it was like one who studies something was kind of what i was deriving from it in my research um you know like a philatelist is, is someone who like studies or collects uh it's not just stamps it's basically like mailing like products like envelopes and, paraphernalia yeah like all like all manner of trans portative writing things like wow. so stamps is part of it but it also encompasses i guess people who collect like envelopes and other things like that too yeah postcards and stuff like huh. that um so i was like i didn't know if like a f like the file part like style of files like someone who loves you know pens but is there like someone who like collects it is there like a more serious i was like mm. is it like the the ist part yeah, the, of the, the term the like ist, the, the ist kind of because if you're denotes, like if you're into science you're a scientist yeah the ist like kind of denotes studies. some sort of expertise right so and a file kind of sounds like an addict yeah so, <laughs> yeah exactly like some a of, bibliophile that's someone who just like loves to read yeah so who loves to read or collects books or something so like i like that. the file i think that makes sense yeah i can think it fits it's it's more about the passion than the yeah. study yeah um, um so i don't know would you i mean would you call like a pen collector or a student be like a, a stylist or a sty styloist? Maybe. Stylo but we're not worried about that. We're worried about like. Stylophilist? We're worried about the passion. Because that, that's, 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 that's our jam. I think jam. stylophile is probably, yeah. probably the most stylophile. appropriate term. There was nothing that I was able to find in any official manner. That makes me think of that. That, <laughs> that makes me think of that, uh, you know that meme with Arnold's hand and Carl Weathers hand doing like the super muscular like hand yeah. grip. You could have you know, fountain pen lovers over here, column lovers over here, and then stylophile. There you go. In the middle. It's like, <laughs> That's right. We need to have a convention. Bring the bring the bring your column lovers to love the next some, pen show. Love me some columns. There we go. Um, yeah, but I mean, all words are basically just made up anyway. Yeah, so, so we, can we pretty could, much make it be whatever we want. If you have a better idea, you know, we'll just say it and keep yeah. saying it, and not shut up about it for a while, and yeah. maybe it'll happen. I mean. I will say, good lord, my, we're still saying turkey hammock. I know you never thought that would have stuck. <laughs> we just made that up. Um, but yeah, in my internet research, I was able to find like forums and message boards going back like 17 years. Oh, wow, that were still debating this exact same thing. Really, they were like, Yeah, I guess what do we call style of file, but is there something else like coin collectors get their own name? Ah. What about this, that, and the other? And I was like, Nobody had any better answers. And I was like, All right, well, we're not gonna solve this problem, but we can at least talk about it anyway. Mm. That's all I got for you. Style file, maybe? Style file. Unless, unless you got better ideas. It makes me think you're we're stylish or something. I don't I don't know. But you wouldn't want to say like pen o file. Nope. Like that sounds, nope. That didn't Let's sound good. Let's leave that alone. Nope. So I don't admit Shut stylo. It down. Stylo is a better direction. Let's go, Let's with, go with that. Great. Okay. Awesome. All right. Anyway, um, I got a question for you, Drew. This is from Coralian. Oh my gosh, I am having a hard time with names today. The, the names are not easy. Coralian. Coralian. I'm going to start giving you all aliases. Okay. Yeah, Bill Johnson says. There you go. Um, do you have any pens in your current collection that you rarely use? Oh. If so, why? Because I don't actually like pens. Why do you hate your pens, Drew? I'm a poser. You're not a stylophile. No. You're a whatever the opposite I'm of that is. I'm a fakey McFakerson. Mm -hmm. um, no, I do have some. And uh, it saddens me to some extent, but I have reasons. I have reasons for all of them. So you need to explain yourself. The first one that came to mind was the Conid Bulk Filler Minimalistica. I love that pen that so much. That pen's so cool. Why it don't is... you use it? Oh, do you use yours? Uh, we're not talking about it right now. We're talking about you, uh -huh. Drew. Okay, so here's the thing. If uh, you're familiar with Conid, they have a very unique filling mechanism. And it's, uh, these pens are hard to get these days. And I find myself pretty frequently showing people how these things fill. 
And after a while of doing that, I just stopped inking it up because I always want to show people how the mechanism works. So now it's just kind of like a display show off piece because I'm like, hey, check this out. Look, you push this thing here and it engages this and you pull it back. Like, so I, I like to have it ready to do that because it, that's like such a fun part of the pen. So I just never mm. inked that one up. It's a nice pen. I like to write with it, but I like to show it off more than I like to write with it, I think. Yeah. Um, and then there are <laughs> pens that are complicated to clean. Um, I have an Edison Menlo a pump filler mm -hmm. so it's got a bladder in it and a little button and every time you pump it the bladder sucks ink up through this little straw that's glued to the end of the feed it's a super cool it's pen a cool concept and it's got a double broad gold nib so Dude. it's just like pfft. so it is actually really fun to write with yeah but not easy to clean yeah and it's got a rubber bladder in there or like i guess it'd be a diaphragm because it kind of just does that deal yeah, um so uh, and Brian Gray told me that, you know, only use gentle inks in there. So mm. I'm pretty much just using Urban inks. <laughs> okay. So I'm a little limited there. So I don't know. I just never reach for it. And That seems like a bit of a, a lot of considerations yeah, you got to make. Yeah. Again. So I, I, don't, I don't use that one too much because it's the cleaning thing. And then I've got a, mm. um, a, a Conklin Crescent filler that I don't usually use because it's got the bladder in yeah, there. Anything and with a bladder. There's a reason why a lot of pen companies don't make bladder. I like anymore. to I like to see how clean something is, you know, and you oh, can't. Yeah, you're never getting that with a bladder. I know, I know. So nope. I don't use those two. So that that's the cleaning aspect. Um, there's the demonstration aspect with the cone, the cleaning aspect with some of those, mm. and then um, there's this one's weird. I don't like. I, I tend to not use pens that have too much capacity. So I I, get that. I love my. I have a Vac 700. Are an Iris. Okay. And I have a Twisby 580 Prussian Blue, both of which I love. They're beautiful pens. You think those have too much they, capacity? I mean, the Vax 700 has. Yeah, a big I like to change out my inks often. So you don't have to fill them all the way. Yeah, you I guess I don't have partially. to do that. I the Vac, the Vac is a little hard. But the Vac is hard to fill partially. I'll give you that. It is, and but and then but both of them though, you still do have to. You know, I like to have my pens completely clean, and it is a bit more to clean both those pens. Yeah, so it is. I just don't find myself reaching for them. Oh, the Prussian blue there. Drew. I know it's a that pen is awesome. it's a stunningly beautiful pen. I just it's too much. I like I, I I like to sample a bunch of inks. Like the amount of times I've used an ink twice, probably I could count on my hands. Yeah, true. Like I true. I like to switch true. it up. There's so much. We we they're all right back there, Brian. We've got like 700 inks. I know. Like I know. 50 yards away. This is probably like unique to your situation. Like you only keep three pens inked at a time. You change out your inks constantly. Yeah. So like things that are more of a hassle to clean and yeah. all that, like that, that does make sense to so, me. So I, I I have found myself avoiding high capacity pens, which makes me sad because I do love them. Okay. Um, I, I don't, you know, forsake them. I still use them, just infrequently. Oh, I think um, we're hearing you loud and clear, Drew. You yeah. hate the Twisby no, Vaxxon Hogar. That I rarely use. You do use not fundamentally rarely. agree with the existence of the Prussian Blue. And then you. finally, there are the pens that are just too nice. Um, I have my Montegrappa Elvis pen that's like super fancy. It's, and I, I've only inked that one up two times. Really? Um, I love it, but it's just, it's so fancy. Mm. And then I was uh, gifted a Waterman's 52 from like 1910 Ooh. that I, I have written with it. It Ooh. writes amazingly beautiful, but it is in its original box with the original instructions. Oh yeah, that's kind of special. It's so special. and But yeah. I know it's like one of the most amazing writing pens it flexes amazingly well yeah but it's, you want it to stay that way though i know right? like, i know and it's been but the, the bladder's been replaced like and you and i like have both that. dropped pens we've ruined nibs like you know it can happen i know i oh, love that pen yeah. so much but I, i'm a little nervous about it i have a waterman 52 as well that i almost never use yeah. for that exact reason it's too. so cool though um yeah. so anyway yeah there's like the two nice things the too much capacity things the hard to clean things and then the coded because i just want to play with it that, that all makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all pretty logical. Um, for me, though, I mean, if I inked it up and just haven't cleaned it, would you still consider that using it? Because if so, I have used a lot. I, I use a lot of pens <laughs> actively. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, for me, the ones that are rarer, harder to clean, harder to repair, that mm -hmm. kind of thing kind of fits in there, too. Um, let's see here. I'm, I tend to maybe use some like weird, special, unique pens maybe a little bit less often just because it's not as helpful like the context of how we end up using pens is like we're often sharing our experience of using them showing them in videos and things like that if i'm using all this crazy weird stuff that nobody can get or maybe i got it at a antique situation and i don't even know really that much about the pen i'm yeah. like ah, if i show this to people i'm gonna get questions i can't answer yeah that's not really helpful to anybody so i'm maybe a little less inclined to use like the 
particularly weird pens. I'm the same way. Not as regularly available. I've got a lot of pens that are from brands that we uh, no longer sell or that we can't sell. Like mm-hmm. you know, I love I I love writing with my Mont Blanc 159, 49. Um, but uh, if I could, I only do three pens. If I write with three pens that I can talk about and right. learn about and educate myself about, like why wouldn't I just use those? Yeah. Like. I use it every, helpful, I use like, it every ex- now and then. Yeah, to like have the experience and yeah. be knowledge. Like I'm the same way. Like I'll acquire, I'll acquire just about anything. Let's be honest. But you know, a pens that like we're not carrying, or like a brand that's not around anymore that we couldn't carry even if we wanted yeah. to. Like I'll I'll get those just because I want to know about them, have that that information, that experience. But it doesn't mean I need to be like actively using them. You know, a lot of they're more like for reference. Yeah. You know, which for our purposes may be a, a bit unique, though other people might feel the same way. They just like to have a variety of experience. Yeah. But for us, like for the purposes of like our jobs and like what we do, it makes more sense to like actively be using the pens that, you know, y'all are using and we're talking about more. And, and the 149 like is we don't carry it. It's hard to clean and too much capacity. So for me, that's like a triple. <laughs> that's a no. Tri- triple now. I've got a 149 that's got a double broad <laughs> oblique or what? something. It's got some weird. I think it's maybe just a regular double broad. God. But it's like, oh, okay, that thing is like. That's a gusher. It's too much. Yeah. It's just too much. But it is a cool pen. Um, and then let's see here. What else do I have? Any pens with sacks. I'm right there with you. They're just a, kind of a pain to deal with. Um, they're a lot of trouble to clean. And then I have another one. Uh, duplicate pens. So like, for example, Lamy Safari. How many versions of a Lamy Safari do I have? You've got like 40. I have insane. a lot because I collect them, right? So I collect the different colors. But like, I might want to use a Safari every now and then, but I'll go back to the same like charcoal Safari, yeah. you know? So especially if I have a pen where there's like a collection and some rarer ones in there, I'm not going to go back and use the like yeah. orange one that it would be really hard for me to replace. Yeah. I'm just going to keep that one for reference and I'll use the charcoal one that if I drop it or lose it or whatever, I can just go grab another one, you know? So I, I definitely, any duplicate pens or collecting you know, type purposes, I'll use, maybe if it's not an exact duplicate, like the same model, but in a different color that's more easier to replace or deal with or whatever, it's not as special, so. There you go, that's mine, that's my process. All right, also makes a ton of sense. Yes, indeed. All, All right. right. Oh, this is a fun one. All right. Matt is putting us in the hot seat All and right, asking us what was one of your biggest professional setbacks slash failures with Goulet pens? How did you overcome it? And most importantly, what did you learn from it? And I made a deal with you, Drew, that if we finish the Q&A by an hour, which we started at about two minutes, it's at 53 minutes right yeah. now. No, that ain't happening. So if we answer this question in less than nine minutes... Mm then we'll do a hypothetical. Doubtful. So we'll see. Um, setbacks. Uh, are you talking just today? Or maybe <laughs> th- this week? Or ever? Because there's kind of too many to cover. Um, I really could pretty much write a dissertation on all of my own personal setbacks and failures. Uh, but I think if I had to say the most obvious setback, it would be COVID. You may oh, have heard of it. Massive setback. <laughs> um, the, the shutdown initially, and then all of the impacts that have come out of everything that's happened since COVID, I'm still dealing with a lot of that. Um, it's really kind of tough to separate my own like issues that kind of all wrap into that versus just like stuff that's happened, you know, in the world that I'm in setbacks because it's all kind of still happening. Um, but COVID for sure has been like the biggest external setback that we've ever experienced as a company by far. Um, it still impacts us today with like ripple effects from everything from supply chain issues, economic uncertainty, um, distraction just from like the news and social media and all that and having to, you know, not only absorb that, but then compete with that in, you know, thing, places like YouTube and other things. Um, just change, changes in online platforms and, and privacy settings and all these types of things that we have to navigate. Um, you know, so those all impact like marketing and advertising, you name it. It's like the, the impacts that have happened have been numerous. Um, but some of the biggest like learning and benefits from all the COVID stuff that's happened. Um, we've incorporated things like more hybrid work and more flexibility, balancing like work and personal life and health stuff like as a company, but then also just like Rachel and I personally have gotten a lot better sense of balance of things since COVID. Yeah, you um, guys set a great example there. We are trying. <laughs> we are a work in progress. Um, and then um, just building resilience in times of uncertainty like this. That has been a un- unwelcomed uh, aspect of <laughs> the whole COVID situation. Um, but yeah, that, that COVID was probably a very obvious answer, but 
that is the biggest one for me. And it's still still ongoing. You okay? I just noticed the sign's a little bright. It's a little bright? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. You want to turn it down a little bit? <laughs> we got this custom sign made, and it's like, as if, oh, that's even brighter. It's got this very ah, imprecise, too much. Oh, too much. There we go. Oh, 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 you can do it. You can do it. Ah, down again. Oh, it's too light. It's oh, about where it was. <laughs> oh, golly. You just keep on going. You have to like hold this like touch sensitive button and it just gets brighter and darker and you have to like find the gradient somewhere in there perfectly. You know what I bet? It, I bet it's because we lost power like a couple of weeks ago and it probably like reset its setting. There we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's not bad. That's not I'm bad. That's better that. than it was. Yeah. All right. There you go. Cool. Drew, how about you? What are your um, failures? The first thing that <laughs> uh, I thought about was one of my first interviews. Um, it was uh, Rachel and I interviewing mm. somebody and I... Uh, used to be more uncomfortable with silence than I am now. I'm better, still have a long way to go. Mm. But um, this interviewee was giving very short, non-descriptive answers. And I absolutely started leading him. Mm. Like, so so what you're saying is, you know, this and this and this and this and this. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty <laughs> much it. I was like, okay, go, awesome, awesome, thank you. Uh, so what about this? Um, yeah. So what, like, so you probably say that, <laughs> Oh, you know, yeah. maybe you are like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Spoon, spoon feeding it, exa oh, it was terrible. Oh, yeah. Because I couldn't, I just couldn't mm. sit in that awkward silence. And I just started just leading him and leading him. And I was just yeah. like, I knew as soon as it was over, I'm like, well, that was terrible. <laughs> so I learned a lot from that one. And you basically uh, interviewed yourself. In that I did. Setting. Yeah. <laughs> It was absolutely awful. Worst yeah. interview I've ever done. Mm. And uh, but I got better after that. You, you know, yeah. I had I had my moments here and there, but I identified them quickly and I was never quite as lost as I was in that one interview. It was mm. one of my first ones. So, yeah. um, yeah. you know, I had it's you know, you got to start somewhere. But it was, oh, God, just think, think looking back and thinking about it. I'm like, <laughs> geez, that was so terrible. Um, and then uh, one of my biggest learning moments, this was another managerial learning moment was. Um, I had a team member that I thought I was supporting by giving them autonomy mm. and, you know, uh, really n not wanting to micromanage. Right. And I, I, in that instance, learned that the balance is really important and that you're not serving someone as a leader if you're not present in, mm. you know, helping them optimize themselves. And distance does not equal trust. Like trust, like, you know, autonomy is a part of that trust equation. Right. But simply saying, you know, I trust you, you got it. And not following up often, mm -hmm. not giving them the direction that they need to do their job well. That's not, that's not the end all be all. Yeah. And um, the job wasn't getting done. And mm -hmm. I, it was a, it was a learning opportunity on my part because you know, I figured out that that balance is absolutely necessary and it's not micromanaging if it's needed. And you need to let that team member show you what's needed and what's not needed. Mm -hmm. And you need to pay attention to what they're showing you because everybody's different. And one team member mm -hmm. might be showing you actually no, like even if they don't want it, they're showing you that they need a little bit more direct involvement or they're showing you that they don't. But all mm -hmm. you need to do is just pay attention and see what's there. And if you pay attention, you can let them decide how much, you know, you can pull back. Like ideally, yes, you will want to pull back. Like your your job as a leader is not to sit there and tell them what to do every day. Like you right. that's not a good leader. You want to be able to have everything working on its own. Mm -hmm. Ideally, um, but everybody takes a different amount of time and a different mm -hmm. style and a different approach in order to get there. And um yeah, that was, that was a big learning opportunity for me. It was like yeah, it's a hard it's a hard balance to find between like especially when you've been a performer and now you're leading people in that role, and then like not micromanaging and trying to like tell them exactly how to do it, yeah. but then also like checking in, being there to support, being clear with them about what's expected, but then letting them kind of find their own way. It is its own yeah. art form. It really and is. even and sometimes they might even tell you like, "Yep, I got I'm 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 going to I'm going to get it done. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Like, I got this." And I'm you're like, like Let's uh, and, and I, let and me you, verify that. Right, you, you, know? don't, you don't want to be that person. And be like, yeah, I don't believe you. And it's hard to it's hard to say. Well, I'd still like to follow up without sounding like I don't trust you. Right. But you need to. 
And it, it, it helps everybody because the job does need to get done. And that person's not going to benefit from not finishing their work. Like they're not going to see a win there. Yeah. Um, so that, that was a tough lesson learned. And, um, you know, I think I, I, I think I developed quite a bit after that, but it was a tough one. And I don't know that, that balance, you don't always hit that balance every time it's, it's, it it's really tough. requires upfront and very clear communication from both the leader and the direct report. Mm. Because if you are a team member in telling your leader what you need and you're not honest, you're not going to get what you need. Mm. And if you're not making sure that you're upfront in, you know, bringing that information out of your team member, you're not going to get out what you need. So it does require, you know, both, but, yeah. um, you know, you need to be able to create that relationship and that open channel of communication. But yeah. it's a rough one. Yeah. Most of the biggest challenges we have are people related just because people are complex and supporting people well. And we have high standards well. for ourselves. We do. Have we have like that. That's yeah. like we, cause we hire great people and we always yeah. have, but um, you know, and so it's not like anything, you know, all of our people challenges are a result of not having good people. They're a result of us wanting to do the absolute best for them. Yeah. And, uh, sometimes that's, that's not easy. Often it's not easy. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So yeah, that's mine. Cool. All right. That's all we got for Q and A. If you have questions and you're an audio listener, shoot us an email at pencast.gulaypens.com or ask us in the, you know, comments on YouTube or wherever the heck you happen to see us. Okay, I we're, we're right 101. At an hour, pretty much. Well, this, true. This, if you want to do a hypothetical, this would be a super easy hypothetical. We could do an easy one. All right, so I have this memorized because it. Uh, this hypothetical came to us from none other than Hill, Ari. Um, so okay, uh, Hillary. She's always sending us random questions. Awesome. So uh, Hillary sent us this a couple of weeks ago, and um, she says, "What objectively." Is the best cheese. The best cheese? <laughs> objectively. I was not expecting that. Objectively. Okay. The superior cheese. Can you have an objectively best cheese? That sounds like a subjective answer to I me. Don't, I, I, I have some thoughts. I can say subjectively what I think no, the best cheese is. No, she, Hill, Hill Ari sub, says subjectively. This is what is Obje required objectively. of us. Objectively. objectively. Objectively, yes. Okay. I will. We have to bring science into this. Science, data, take ourselves out of the cheese equation, take your cheese preferences and throw them out the door. How am I going to do that? <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, I'm no cheese connoisseur, so there could be some magical cheese I've never experienced. I don't think there's magical that cheese. Fits the, there's a lot of types of cheese. All right. Do you, like, you want to hear my, my, my thing? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and tee this off and maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll like just tack onto your answer. If I'm being subjective, uh, no. it's... It's, Why are you being subjective? I'm just the saying. I'm, 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 I'm showing Drew. off, right? I'm going to show you how I can just throw my personal cheese feelings out the door. Okay. I'm a cheddar man. I love me some cheddar. Okay. I put cheddar on my pizza. Okay. I my my perfect mac and cheese is just plain elbow macaroni. Okay. With a ton of cheddar, like freshly grated cheddar mixed in. Put that in the oven for a little while. That's my macaroni and cheese. Not, not bad way to go. Love it. Cheddar on my burgers. Cheddar, cheddar, cheddar. My my sharp, my, mild, extra, extra sharp. sharp. Extra sharp, sharp as can be. extra sharp grocery, you want it to like grocery cut your store. mouth you want it Absolutely. to be so sharp At like my <laughs> ideal movie snack is just nacho like just tortilla chips with a layer of cheddar more tortilla chips more cheddar more tortilla chips more cheddar bake delicious wow. nothing else doesn't that come out as like one solid chip no, Isn't no. it like adhered together? No, no. You, the great, gr freshly grated cheese melts pretty well okay, uh, rather than okay. the sprinkle stuff in the bag. I gotcha. Okay. I'm a cheddar man. Love me some cheddar. All right. Cheddar bow biscuits. Mm. Oh, those are so good. good. I'm going to toss cheddar out the door, Brian, because you cheddar is not objectively not objective the superior cheese. Okay. The superior cheese is mozzarella. Mozzarella is pretty good. Mozzarella can be eaten just plain. It's delicious. It can be eaten on a pizza in discs. It can be eaten on a pizza just in sprinkles. You can put a slice of mozzarella on any, you know, uh, deli sandwich and have it be enjoyable. Like anywhere, you can put mozzarella on nachos and have a great mm. time. You Like mozzarella can be, go just about wherever any other cheese can go. Yeah. And you can't, and you can't, if you take away mozzarella, you are ruining pizza. Like even as much as I love cheddar, putting a whole pile of cheddar on pizza... <laughs> Cheddar it's a is, bit much. Cheddar is so oily too. Yeah. Like it, that wouldn't work. Like you could say provolone maybe 
if you wanted just a less tasty pizza, I mean, provolone is basically just a, you know, sadder version of mozzarella. I mean, provolone is good as a sandwich cheese, but I wouldn't want that on like nah. a pizza or a no. salad. I mean, it has a salad, be, I guess it'd be okay. It has to be mozzarella, right? Mozzarella, is, that's a really solid answer. I mean, you, you're not going to, like, if, you're, if you've got a party and you've got a little deli tray, your veggies, your, you know, mixed up whatever, and no, you might not be able to have those little cheese cubes of Swiss cheddar and pepper jack, but putting mozzarella there is quite, that's e even better. So, especially if you get some like buffalo mozzarella, like some real fresh stuff. Oh, that stuff is good. Also, mozzarella it is the is superior cheese to throw at someone. Like, yeah, like a, a big ball of it. Yeah, yeah, a big wet ball. Like that's the that is the that has the perfect throwing cheese. Hit someone right in the back of the neck. One yeah, of, if you one hit of your somebody enemies, with a block of cheddar, like you're gonna you're gonna no, knock them out. I don't, I don't I don't hate anybody <laughs> that much. But there's some people. There's a couple of people I would like chuck a nice wet ball of cheddar right at the yeah. back of their head. I feel like brie is a good throw throwing cheese as well. Oh, like that's a nice, I don't hate anybody that much either. It's got kind of a soft, you know. <laughs> like especially a hot it's got brie. Kind of a mozzarella. I don't know about oh, hot. God. I don't know about hot. No. Just splat. No. And brie would have a little bit of give to it, you know, nice and soft. Depends on how much you warm it up. <laughs> I'm just, the, I don't know what I'm visualizing here. I, I would visualize uh, like really hot brie that you just score in certain areas. So upon hmm. impact, it explodes in a nice wet burning. Oh my gosh. It's like napalm. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> That's terrible. I mean, um, mozzarella is a really good answer. I can't. Yeah, I can't I, come up with a better one than that. I think it has to be. I like mozzarella. Gouda too. But I love it's not Gouda. As, no. It's not as universal no. as mozzarella. No, that's a. I can't come up with better. Mozzarella, the superior cheese. All right, thank you, Hill. Ari. There we go. Good question. And if anybody else uh, doesn't feel that's true, um, keep it out of my comment section because I don't want it. You keep you keep your you keep your cheese nonsense to yourself unless you want to agree yes mozzarella yes. is superior yeah that's the way to go that people definitely won't share their opinions when you tell them it's not welcome so get, get your job. cheese out of here good job on that Drew. take your cheese feelings and put them out the door <laughs> Drew's just trolling for comments right now oh my gosh okay uh, well if you disagree with me one you day you're question. gonna have a soggy ball of mozzarella <laughs> thank you oh my gosh Drew's Sorry, just gonna be pelting you with mozzarella. <laughs> Like a snowball fight. When you least expect it. Oh my gosh. You'll be in the Arby's ordering yourself a beef and cheddar and then out of nowhere. No well. Wet oh, ball of mozzarella. Wet mozzarella is going to smack you upside the head. <laughs> what is happening right now? Oh, what yeah. is this turned into? I'm uh, kind of hungry. Anyway. I know. I could eat some cheese right now. I want now. some pizza. I, I do kind of want some pizza. <laughs> I might be getting pizza tonight for my kids. That sounds uh, amazing. Fix them up on the way home. Uh, anyway. Well, that was a fun question, but uh, now we're going to pen spotlight the pilot Pereira. So let's check that thing out. All right, there's the Pereira, Pereira, everybody. Drew, is this a pocket pen? Would you call this a pocket pen? Uh, I mean, that's where we got to start off with this. Here, thing. Here's the thing: the Twisby Vac Mini is just like a few millimeters apart from this, and if that is called a mini, is it shorter than this? The mini is it shorter? Just by a little bit. Just by a tiny bit. Yeah, just by a hair. It's not a huge pen, but I, you know. It's it's not a pen. Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, let's ignore that. That was chunky. That was loud. All right. So it's not it's not a huge pen, no. but it is, you know, unlike other pens that we've used, you know, here laughably. Um, this one I can write with without a posted. Really? Uh, yeah. Okay. It fits in there. Like it's it's comfortably like tucked in. You know. Yeah. So it is doable. I prefer it posted, especially Definitely. because it's such a light pen. Yeah. It feels a little more balanced in my hand you know and then i don't have to be like as intentional about like keeping it up there i can i can move my hand further back or whatever um but it definitely so, is a smaller pen for sure it is it is um i think this one gets overlooked a lot because it's a clear pen um you know so it maybe doesn't distinguish itself quite as much as other clear pens the price point I, itself is in like i think it's 60 bucks 60 70 bucks in that in that price range which is quite a bit of a jump off from most of the other pilots. It is, because it does have the nibs. same nib. The same nib is what you get on the Kakuno, the X, uh, Blur, the Metropolitan, which honestly is not a bad thing because no, it's a great if nib. you wanted to have spares or swap it out with different sizes, you can get other nib sizes with this, you know. The Kakuno's the $14, and yeah, a $14 spare nib is actually more affordable than a lot of other spare nibs on the market. This is true. And then you get a smiley face Free on pen, it. yeah. Um, I do like the demonstrator aspect to it. You can use cartridges or converters. It does not fit a Con 70. Um it's tempting to want to eyedropper convert it, but I don't think that that's generally wise just because you get 
this whole back section here. I don't know like yeah. how well glued this is. I've heard of some I've people. I've done it before. Yeah, it can be done. It's been done successfully, but I've had, I've seen other people that have done it and it's leaked. Yeah, I would So I don't think it. it's the most reliable. I also don't think it's totally necessary. You can just fill like a, a cartridge and, yeah. and be just fine. Um, other neat things about this. Let's see. The cap is awesome. Like it is one of the more satisfying Here, put, 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 put that up to your mic and do that. So yeah, I'll just like... Oh yeah, that's nice. That's very nice. That's nice, very satisfying cap. Um, the thing that I don't necessarily love about it, I know I what you're gonna you say. Feel. It's yep. the white insert. Like, it's okay. It doesn't like not match it's the pen. It's so It's big. just in your freaking yeah. face. And everything and else is so the clear. Nib, and I'm like, I wanna see the nib. Yeah. Now, I mean, on the plus side, if you get any inky splatteriness happen up here, it's gonna be less obvious. Though I will say- This one, one's pretty easy to remove, isn't it? Uh, this one is a little bit more of a pain. Oh, it is? Is it screwed in? Um, I honestly don't remember. I feel like there was extra steps involved with this one. You're probably right. It's like kind of squared off inside oh, of there. Oh, yeah. So I feel like I had to do something weird with it before. Because normally what I'll do is I'll take a pencil and I'll wrap in a race, a, yeah. like a rubber band yeah, or rubber something band like that right. around the end. And that friction is enough to get it out. But I feel like on this one, I actually used like a square drive, like screwdriver oh, bit okay. well, to get mind. it out. But th it wasn't a problem. I mean, if you have some basic tools, you can do it. Um, and I, you might be able to do it with a rubber band pencil trick, but I think I just found it easier to, yeah. to do it. It is um, really well made though. In the hand, it does yeah. feel like the, the Metropolitan has a substance to it. It does have a weight to it that this one does not have. Mm -hmm. But overall, the Metropolitan does feel... Uh, I don't know. It's, it's way more simple. It's less complex. So, I mean, if you look at this pen, you've yeah. got a lot more segments to it than you do with the Metropolitan. Mm -hmm. And it is harder to polish a clear pen like this. So you do see some manufacturing extra steps that I think contribute to the cost. But overall, it's a really nice pen, really easy to use pen that fits a wide variety of hand types. Yeah. And you do get a it lot doesn't, of... It doesn't have as aggressive as a step no. as the Metropolitan has. So that's really nice, especially if you find that you're finger falls like right on the the cross between the grip and the body mm -hmm. it's it's really rounded off it's not obtrusive at all so that's quite comfortable i think overall the the prayer has a really good reputation it it's does. a super reliable writer really attractive pen it's very lightweight so writing with it for a long period of time is really easy and it's easy on the hand and it's a really good size i think i mean it it looks a little smaller in my hand because i have particularly large hands but it's still comfortable enough for me. But I think this is like a really good pen for somebody with more like average or smaller size mm -hmm. hands. Um, so it's a very universally kind of accepted size, I guess. Um, and, and it does nothing, seal nothing, well. It does seal well. Nothing crazy going on with the grip shape or anything like that. Um, so all in all, it's just a very favorable pen. I think it just, it gets overlooked a little bit because it seems like it's priced a little higher because the other steel nib pilot pens are so affordable. Um, but I think if you stack this one up against other pens in its price range, it can go toe to toe. Absolutely. With you know, Lamy Studio or a lot of different Monteverde pens and stuff like that. I think this one's definitely worth a look. And it's coming in about like six different colors too, right? It comes in different colors, but the color is very slight. It's just like in these little end sections here. Mm -hmm. um, and the rest of the pen is basically the same. So not as drastic a different with the colors as you might see on say like a Twisby or something like that. but. All in all, very... Uh, is this one called something pen. else overseas? I don't know, because that often happens with Japanese I can't, pens. I, can't, I don't I think... I think it, it's called the Prera I think it's around. the Prera, I think but so, yeah. I'm not certain. Sometimes they have pen names that are in one country, like the home country, but then when they take it abroad, there's already like a trademark or something yeah. like that, or it competes too much, or it means something, you know, not ideal <laughs> in that language or something like that, so they have to change it. Um, but yeah. I think that was the case with what was it like the Stella became the E95S because the Stella uh, was the Elite became the E95S. The Elite, that's the what Stella it was. was the Stargazer. Stargazer, that's right. Yeah, so they change names sometimes, but I think it's the Prera all around. Yeah, cool. But all yeah, right. good pen. It's worth checking out. I think that I like um, the Elite the name better than I like E95S. But yeah, I definitely like Stargazer more than I like Stella. For sure, for sure. All right, there you go. Prera is a fun one. Let us know if you're. If it's you're a, a Prera one. fan. Yeah. I think that Prera's got some dedicated, happy people it's out there. It's got a loyal following, for sure. It does. Yeah. I don't know anybody who, like, hates the Prera. Yeah. No. I it's certainly good. don't. I think it just gets overlooked. Yeah. All right. 
Drew, what's happening? What is happening? Um, I'm going to tell you some stuff. Um, I had a lazy weekend, Brian. Really? It was a quite, 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 quite a lazy weekend. <laughs> um, but uh, before that, on Friday, Archer, my son, my nine-year-old, had field day at his school. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing you knew this, having two kids yourself. They don't really do contests anymore. It's hard for me to say because, like, we had the whole COVID virtual schooling thing mm. happen during like prime field day years. Like, I think Ellie has a field day coming up. So they did tug the of future. war. Okay. And then they, uh, but that's, uh, and then they did a hula hoop competition. Hmm. But that was really it. They didn't do like the whole sack race or like walking with really? the egg and the spoon or like hmm. the 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 thing where you put the basketball between your legs and hop or yeah. nothing like that. That's no? all. That's all done. I, I I don't know. So what are they doing? Just farting around? They have like music and they're outside and so they're just kind of in a field having a day. Yeah, I mean there were activities I think and they sang. A, I remember like and they sang a song. I remember competing. Yeah, well, that, like, that's all it was. It was yeah. just contests and there were ribbons uh, yeah. Yeah. given out. And that was actually one thing that they did not do participation trophies for. When we were kids, they, there was like, you could get first place, second place, or no place. You oh, know? yeah. There were no participations for field yeah, day. So, um, I, I, I understand that they're, you know, that we is had a being, shirt. We had a shirt for field day. They that did, was sort of like They did have a shirt. Um, they, they um, you know, every grade has a shirt. So, that is continuing. That's still a thing. Okay. But, yeah, not a lot of games. They did do tug of war, though. And he said that was a lot of fun. Hmm. Um, but I was surprised that the whole game aspect didn't seem to be as prevalent. Now, I'm sure it's different in other, you know, states, yeah, counties. It could but, be different school to school. Who knows? Yeah. But. But uh, yeah, not a whole lot. Um, he did get to do a hula hoop competition, though, where he came in second. And uh, he was quite salty about it because uh, uh, I saw a picture and, you know, all these other kids are sitting down and he's like the only kid standing up still hula hooping. Um, but he said that he got second because one of the teachers told him to try to do it on his foot. And so when he tried it, it fell off and he lost. I was like, wow. I was like, that teacher trying to frame you that's messed up he's that's, like yeah, yeah I, 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 um, he's like i would have won but yeah he was a little sour about that i mean that's understandable mm. i think that teacher might have had ulterior motives perhaps i think so paid off it's by the setup. parents mm. a setup yeah of course he can't resist a trick though like hey do a kickflip like okay <laughs> um but uh yeah that was a thing uh, but this weekend yeah i kind of just took it easy i, I mm -hmm. played a lot of video games and uh i watched a um an animated batman movie with archer uh -huh. i i i was kind of curious, like, they still make animated superhero movies, right? What's like the deal with those? Like a newer one? New-ish, I guess. Probably, like, it might have been, like, 2010 or something like that. So maybe not new-ish. Not, Is not, that new? I don't know anymore. I, it wasn't a, I wasn't a kid when it came out, so to me that's new. Okay. Um, but, yeah, we watched that, and it was it was pretty solid. Um, good, solid voice cast. It was called Under the Red Hood, where one of Batman's dead partners comes back to life and is a bad guy, so... That's a thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a it's a thing. It was a comic. And then they, you know, that's kind of what they do. If it was a good comic, they kind of make it an animated movie. And yeah. I just okay. haven't really dug into that. But it was, no, it was solid. He enjoyed it. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> then I needed to, uh, I didn't need to coerce him, but I did need to go to the dump and, you know, trash one of those like cheap Target pieces of furniture with the squares, you know, that's oh, just. Yeah. It was that one of those things. Several of these in my house. It's one of those things where you buy it for a reason, and yep. then it moves into a different room for like kind of a reason, and then it mo keeps moving until you're like, this thing is totally useless. And we just and keep, after you move it like three times, you're like, this thing is held it, together with it's, nothing but like yeah. tape at this point. Yeah. So I we had to just get that out of there. Um, so right. I went to the dump, uh, threw that away, and a couple other things. But I did tell him, I'm like, hey, how about just to avoid any fuss? I'm like, I know you're playing your game. I need to go to the dump. I'll get you a snack. You know, I'll let you pick a snack. We'll get you a snack when we go out because I needed to go to the uh, um, garden center too and get some dirt. Uh, so I have done all of these things with my kids. Not, and the excitement is pretty minimal. It on is, their, but I'm like, you, you can get a snack. He's like, I want ice cream. I was like, all right, that's fine. I'll get you some Ooh. ice cream. He wanted soft serve vanilla ice cream. And that, okay. that basically means McDonald's or Dairy Queen. Okay. Like nowhere, that's not that's not a common place. You know, there's not a lot of other Chick -fil -A places. Chick-fil-A have ice cream? They have milkshakes. I don't know if they have soft serve ice cream. I don't like know. Like cones of ice cream. They might. Oh, they might. I've never seen a cone they of ice might. cream come out of Chick-fil-A. They might. I think they might. Oh. Look into it. Well, went to McDonald's. Of course, you know what happened. What? The machine was broken, probably? Yep. 
That's a thing. Oh, it absolutely I've is. I've seen a YouTube thing. videos about this. It really is. And like she it's didn't like even a conspiracy of like the machine management company or whatever. I've heard yeah. that the machine yeah, I think the machine management company is like not McDonald's. It's like right. a third party company. They have like a contract with McDonald's, yeah. but the the machines are down like at least a quarter of the time. Yeah. And I told Across Archer, I was like, hey, just so you know, <laughs> it's probably broken. And yep. It and was. He, yeah. It oh. def definitely was. So that was a bummer. So I just I, I de didn't want him to have this thing, but we were at the grocery store a couple of weeks ago and he saw this weird like packet of like sour juice, squeezy bottle oh, thing. Oh yeah, that garbage oh, candy Oh, absolutely stuff. garbage. Oh, I was into that stuff as a kid. But I told him like, no, no, and we're you, not doing you that. you try it and you're like, this is going to be amazing. And you eat it and you're like, yeah, this is no. very good. He loved it. Yeah. I told him like, all right, how about we're right next to the grocery store. I'll take you in there and I'll get you that garbage, squirty, gross sugar thing you wanted. And he got pretty excited about that. So he's in the back. It's the, he's eating these these gummies, and the gummies have like a little like divot in them. So he's taking this squirt bottle with just like sour sugar ooze, squirting it in the little thing, and I'm eating the ooze filled gummy. And so he just had a great old time. So that was he was hey, like, that's what matters. Yeah, he enjoyed it, right? Yeah. So and then I, once I have placated the kid, I uh, went to Strange's to get some raised bed soil because I was going to do that and um, uh, went out and uh, went ahead and picked up a lavender plant too because I've never done lavender before. So that's the only, mm. that's the only non-seed. I, I killed the lavender plant last year. Oh, well, this is the first, this is the <laughs> only one I bought this year. Everything else I started from seeds, but the la okay. lavender, I actually bought a pot, pot of lavender. Um, and then went home and um, started the, uh, no, that day it was a little wet and rainy. So I waited until Sunday to do the garden, but I got all my tomato plants, all my peppers, and everything in the raised bed. All right. I also had some extra pepper, so I put those in one of our one of my grow bags. So I'm doing mm. um, two different types of pepper, doing mini bell peppers, which are just, you know, like whatever, eat yeah. them. And then shishito peppers, which are, um, you know, kind of more wrinkly, like spicy pepper shape, but they're mm. not spicy. Okay. Except one in 10 is like spicy. And I, oh. and you don't really know which one. I it's know. Like, it's like bean boozled. I'm hoping that I'll be <laughs> able to find, like, like nibble the, like end on one and hopefully tell if it's spicy because I'd like to cook with them because they're really pretty. But you can't cook a whole meal with no, it in there. No, especially not with Shannon in right, the house. Right, right. So I don't know what I'm doing with those. And then two different types of tomatoes and then I'm going to do um, butterfly pea and baby's breath. Those flowers got in the pots as well. Okay. And I had to do this thing because I, I looked up what to do while well, I was looking at the back of the packet of seeds for the butterfly pea. It's a mm. it's a pea, so it, gr it, it grows on a trellis, okay. but it produces these edible blue flowers. Hmm. And... It said on the back to scarify my seeds. I'm like, what is that? So I had to Google it and you like means scratch them up, right? Or kind of, yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to. They're very hard, like very, very hard, almost like mm. nuts. They're so hard. Okay. So I had to take a little micro file and file a little chunk out of them, and then soak them um, for like eight hours, and then plant them. So I did that whole thing on Sunday. I know it's a what bit a much. prima donna of a plant here. Jeez, it kind of is. Yeah, it's probably because like I guess if like squirrels or birds or whatever or, like it's to chewing it. Like it's it to, scratches I think it think it's up to naturally. I think it's to prevent. I think I don't know I, exactly. I think it's to prevent it from um uh, blooming too early. But I don't know. Like hmm. while it's still cold. Interesting. I, I don't know. It's supposed to just speed things up. So I did that. I hopefully I didn't ruin them all because I'm like I don't know. Am I scratching it up too much? Wow. I don't know. So those are in there. Um, it was an experience, but uh, it was really nice and relaxing. And I really like having all my plants out there in, in the soil. Hmm. And um, there was not one social activity that I was engaged with this weekend. Wow, so that's weird. It's nice for me to have those. Yeah. It was actually quite relaxing. And <laughs> it, it, re it recharged me. Nice. So just video games, gardening, and... Dumping. Yeah, going to the dump. Yeah. So it was quite a low key uh, weekend for me. Drew, maybe I'm rubbing off on you a little bit here. I mean, a little more antisocial. I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the list. Bit. I'll give you the list of projects I am ignoring in the house, and I'll show you how <laughs> unlike you I am. I my do you, remember, do you remember the um, my front porch lights having get, gotten messed up by the power washer? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to know whether or not those are still are they, replaced? Are they fixed yet? They are still out. You called somebody to fix those, right? And oh, he gave me a hundred dollars to replace the lights oh he, he's you just like need to get it done mm -hmm. okay it's been about a year oh wow 
darkness on the outside. <laughs> we went through we went through all of the dark like daylight savings months where it was yeah. dark when I got home, uh-huh. and every day I'm like, well, that's creepy and dark, and my house looks <laughs> abandoned because I have no lights <laughs> outside, crazy. and it still did not behoove me wow. to get it done. Wow. I know. Wow. So yeah, I I would I would love to have a little bit of your go get them home repair whatever you call that i wish i knew where it came from i wish i could bottle it up and uh, sell it yeah no i, I would take <laughs> I some could retire and every day i get out of my car and like i run into a, a bush that's like right next to my door i'm like ah, i need to trim this thing yeah i gotta trim that sucker but then i go inside i'm like all right what other stuff that I, can i get distracted by and <laughs> i only see that dumb bush when i get into yeah. my car i'm like dang it i need to trim that and then i get out <laughs> dang it and then i get inside it's gone just <laughs> yeah. totally absolutely absent absolutely but no i'm all good Things are things are nice. Nice. Um, on to me. Sure. All right. So I mentioned last week that I was going to be pretty much like leaving to go to a conference. That's right. After shooting the pencast. That's right. Technically, I left the following day, but yeah, I went to Indianapolis and back. In between the time that I shot the pencast and then in the time that we published, Indiana basically. Yeah. Oh. I have never been to Indiana, and now I have. Got to say, it was way windier than I thought it would be. Very windy. Like 30 mile an hour winds pretty consistently. It was weird. Didn't expect that. But I guess it's very flat, you know. Anyway, but um, so I went there for a conference, a work conference called EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. Mm -hmm. Um, It was good. There was about 2,000 people at this conference. That's a lot. Which is bigger than most of the And was that all just in one room? Um, like, there was like one main room. It was like geez. three, it was on three different floors in this Marriott downtown, like near the Colts stadium. Three floors. It was a pretty big hotel. Yeah. I think the, the hotel itself was like 30 something floors and like you have like the hotel lobby and there's like kind of a little check-in area, but then like basically like the next couple of floors, like all the conference rooms and stuff is where all this stuff was happening. Okay, so it wasn't just one room, like there were multiple Well, there was one big room where like the keynotes and all that kind of stuff were happening. But then the breakout rooms, there were like, you know, seven to 10 sessions happening at a time during each breakout thing. So it was a, there was a good, good amount of people. So this this hotel was built for that. Yeah, and apparently this happens all the time at this place. So um, anyway, it was a very well-run thing. Um, but it was really good because I mean, honestly, more or less, this was a conference about having meetings and leadership stuff. Yay. Like literally before we shot the Ben I came out of a meeting and Drew was like, you really like meetings, don't you? Cause I'm in meetings all, like all the time. Yes. And I was like, I just went to a conference that largely talked about meetings and other things. Cause this Ooh. is what adulting is sometimes. Um, but no, it was, it was really good. Um, talked about things like, you know, just effective communication, you know, meeting structures, meeting rhythms, that kind of stuff, organizational health, leadership, like that kind of stuff. Are we doing anything wrong um, with our meetings right now that we need plenty, to stop? Really? Plenty. Always. I mean, there's always room to improve. Like running too long or not ending when we should? Just mainly the problem with meetings that most people experience is a lack of clarity about the purpose of the meeting. Mm. So what's, that thing, like, what's that thing that you say with you give it an hour, it's going to take an hour? That is called the Parkinson's Parkinson's law. That's it. Which is, yeah, work will fill whatever time that you allot. I get, it. I get Peter Principal and Parker thing. Peter Parker packed a right pick of peppers. I knew it was one of those. <laughs> I said Parkinson, thinking that is it the Peter Principal or is I, it I have Parkinson's? To think, I have to think about it because there's also something called the Pareto Principle, which oh, is the eight, the eighty twenty. I think I think of just Peter Parker. Yeah, you're probably yeah. it's probably about right. What the the Peter Principle is. You know, um, you'll be promoted to your highest level of incompetence. Mm. So basically, you'll keep getting promoted until you're not good at what you do anymore, and then you'll stop getting promoted. Oh, yeah. Which probably speaks to a lot of different people that we can all envision right now. Yeah. But um, yeah, anyway. And then the Pareto principle. Hey, let's cover all the P's. <laughs> That's the 80 20 rule, which is like basically can be applied to a lot of different things. Oh, like, like the but 20% like, of your inventory makes up 80% of your profit. Exactly. Or, or like or 20% in, of your customers represent 80% of your time and stress. Exactly. Ah, exactly. yes. So you can apply that to a lot of things or like whatever whatever issues your kids are going through, like 80% of your time will be spent by 20% of whatever the issue is. And mm. so, yeah. Um, but anyway, so a lot of that type of stuff and uh, a lot of it was like 
a lot of it echoed things that we've already covered. Good. You know, like we've done a lot of Brene Brown stuff and Patrick Lencioni and, you know, some other like people's stuff from that. And it, a lot of similar sources. So it wasn't just about like, you know, you know, schedules and organization. It was about communication no, and some of that yeah. human stuff. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Well, that's, that's more exciting. Yeah. It was, it was very interesting. Okay. It was very interesting. Because it feels just about I really like, appreciate it. like, no, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like an office space. You know, oh, vibe. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. These are like, all people who are like working more or less in entrepreneur, they're either like business owners or they're like in leadership roles at entrepreneurial companies, nice. okay. mostly smaller companies. So like the vibe was good and I found it very constructive. Um, and it's helpful for me to go to this kind of stuff because I mean, you see me when I run around here all day, it's like we're talking super granular detailed stuff about pens and then we're going, I'm talking, looking at some plumbing thing and then, you know, I'm dealing with something completely different. We're doing some marketing thing and looking at Google Analytics or whatever and then I'm going into some meeting or strategic oh. planning. Oh, it's yeah. like, <sighs> if I'm near you and Rachel long enough, I just get tired. Yeah. Just, just being, just witnessing, <laughs> what, just witnessing what you what, guys do. What goes on yeah. each day. Yeah. It's exhausting. It's fun. You got to be wired for it, but it is definitely helpful to um, spend time kind of in that headspace. Yeah. So that's where I was last week. And traveling like forces you to stay in that headspace too. Like when it you, does. when you, yeah. rather than like watching a video on something, you I can, mean, that has its place too. It does, but you get, you can easily get distracted from it. And then as soon as it is, yeah. as soon as, as it's over, it's on to the next thing immediately. Yeah. And you don't really have time to reflect when you're in a hotel. It's like that, what you like watch, what you there. watch just kind of mm -hmm. stays with you and you process yeah. it in a different way. Yeah. Was a hotel nice at least? The hotel was nice. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was like a day and a half, you know, so we were there for like two nights basically. Um, but one of the things I got to do was they had a like dinner, whatever thing in the Colts stadium. Oh, so they like ran out the stadium or whatever. And I got to like throw a football on the Colts field and I got to try to kick a field goal, which I kicked it high enough, but my aim was off. So I did not make a field goal. That's still cool. It was still pretty fun. You know? Okay. Yeah. Well, the lights on and stuff. Yeah. And, oh, wow. Yeah, so I got to like run on the field and I was like, this is literally like where these athletes play. Did and you run like full blew speed? my mind a little bit. No, nah, I didn't really run. I didn't really feel like oh. doing too much work, but I threw the ball and I did okay. Okay. I'm not a great sports person oh neither am normally I. when i throw a football it's like blah, like really wobbly yeah. but i threw a couple of really good spirals and i was okay. like okay I'm gonna, no, I'm, not. I'm gonna throw i threw a couple good ones and i was like i'm gonna stop because the next one i do is gonna look terrible i would still run full speed just because just because you could yeah. just like I, race across i have the, the i have the energy level of someone much more fit than i am <laughs> so like my my, my That's problem a good way to put it yeah like i i you mm. know i do things that my body probably shouldn't do it's like why are you doing mm. this every now and then when you live such a sedentary life like stop like you're 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 falling and jumping and running and leaping so intermittently i'm just going to injure myself one day mm, yeah because i'm like oh i should just run now but yeah. i don't run like my body like is ever? not a runner's body but yet like my mind's like oh yeah you should you should try to you should see how many stairs you can jump up to see what happens i'm like i'm gonna the the, the concrete stairs up there i'm yeah. going to fall on one day oh, don't tell me that <laughs> because I, I i try to leap all of them I feel like workers comp, like, yeah. la, 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 I'm not hearing any of this. <laughs> Just do One it of off the days. company property, please. No, I'm ready for it, though. So I'm like, <laughs> every time I'm like, this is going to be it. I'm going to fall right on my face bump. So I'm, I'm not because you're doing anything dumb. Just like you're expecting to, or are you doing dumb things? No, I'm just leaping up the stairs all in oh. one bound. It's okay. like four, yeah. four stairs. So you're doing dumb things. Okay. I'm, I'm, or one could say I'm working efficiently by, you are, know. Are you though? I'm skipping steps. I'm literally, I'm, I'm. Doing, doing, doing in one move what others take four to do, Brian. Wow. wow. How is that not efficiency? Can, I mean, just think of the minutes you're adding up over the years <laughs> by doing this. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a good investment, Brian. Trust me. Uh, I'll take you're your making, you're it. making yeah. so much money with me. I'm just, uh, I'm yeah. an asset, a true asset. You Leaping are, stairs, one way to put bounding it. hallways, mm -hmm. optimizing. Mm -hmm. That's what I do every day, day in, day out. Yeah. Until I injure myself. Yeah, optimize <laughs> for sure. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Like a walking Pareto principle, Drew. Um, <laughs> oh uh, my gosh. Um, I've never been called that before. Yep. Yeah. Um, but what was cool, we took our director of operations and director of HR. So it wasn't just me going to this conference. Which you've been to like pen shows and you've been places like on your own and you get back and you're like all jazzed up and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm dealing with other things. And you're like, but, uh, but stuff, and but I, it was fun. And there was good things to take away from this. So that's how I usually, <coughs> excuse me, 
that's how I usually am coming back from these like conference mm -hmm. things. So it's nice to have like a couple other people that went with me and I'm like, we can bounce some ideas, right. you know, off each other. And I'm like, okay, I'll get like a little more life out of this experience because I wasn't the only one doing it. You know? Yeah. Especially because you come back and then it's like, oh, here's a thousand emails and all these things that happened while you were away. And it's like, ah, crap. Yeah. You know, I got to like double up and get things done anyway. Um, but <laughs> I watched Severance again while we were going. <laughs> Because Sam hadn't seen it. That doesn't mean you have to watch <laughs> it with him. To. Well, I want to die. Yeah, he can watch true. it by himself. That's true, but I did anyway. Oh my god, we watched the entire thing. Because like the on the plane is, there, the and thing the plane is, back. you are saying that. Oh, I've never seen a Rocky. I've never seen this. I've never seen that. I'm just gonna watch Severance forever. I think I've seen it ten times now. You have the time. Yeah, you're like oh, I don't have time I to do watch movies. Time. I only have time to watch Severance. We all have 24 hours in a day. Oh you know? my god. But anyway, I watched it. Sam was super into it, but he hated the end. He hated the cliffhangers. Oh, the end was amazing. I thought it was amazing too. Yeah. I was so shocked. Well, and also the whole series is cliffhangers. Like I know. Every episode this is, is one big what, cliffhanger. What did you, what'd you expect? I don't know. Maybe it was a big tease. It, he, he threw me off. He didn't like it. But anyway, I love it. I love it enough for all of us. Yeah, Mandalorian season three just finished and it had a wonderful ending. Okay. Like a nice, conclusive, mm. rich, well done ending. Yeah. And uh, which is great because the whole series, Archer's just like oh come on every, at the, and at the end of every every episode but then the finale happened he's like oh okay nice satisfier yeah awesome so I like solid. it i like it um also i'd been intending ever since i went on a field trip with my daughter uh at the science museum i intended to go back and take our whole family i have that same intention because archer recently went yep. And, yeah yep and we did it this weekend Finally, um, nobody was sick. <laughs> the weather wasn't terrible or whatever. We were able to make it isn't work. It like, isn't it like 20 bucks a person or something It's like not that? the cheap. I think it was like 15 bucks a person or something yeah, like that. So not we're not going to go all the time. Yeah. But it was like, Ellie was really excited about it because she had gone. And I was like, yeah, this would be fun. Joseph hadn't been since he was like five, mm -hmm. you know, and he didn't remember anything. So I was like, all right, we'll go. And we went and it was exhausting, mm -hmm. but they had a good time. Did you do the thing where you race the red line to see what sort of animal you're faster than? Yep. I'm faster than a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Are you really? I'm faster than a rat. You you beat the rat? I beat the rat. The rat's fast. The rat's not as fast as me. Whoa. I can... I Alpha can, Predator. I can, I can hustle when I need to. Apex Predator. Are you getting um, those rats? I mean, it's a pretty short runway, so... I you, can, still got, you still got away, the rat. I can get away from a rat for about two and a half seconds. After I'll, that, he'd probably get me. I always like to think, like, you know, if I was just a, a human being out in the wild against other animals... Would I even be a predator or would I just be prey? You'd be prey. Well, the, I could get a, if, if you can get a rat, I can get a rat. I mean, you might be able to run faster than a rat, but. You, you can still get one? No, nah, you're going to be like. Now nah, you leap. You leap and get the rat. Just like, you know, Crocodile Mile. You know, you run. Yeah, but that's like slide, after you've had a healthy breakfast that ramp, like somebody else made dive. and all that. Like, you and I would both, we would both die immediately. We don't know how to survive in the wild. Are you kidding me? We just need to find rats. We still found pens. We're talking to a camera, Drew. Just There's no it. way we're surviving in the wild. It depends. Are there chickens in the wild? The chickens would probably take us out. Dang it. You're probably right. <laughs> Played Zelda one too many times. We wouldn't know how to eat anything. Are you, you kidding attack me? attack one chicken, they all come We'd at you. We'd be like Michael Scott in the forest, like oh, eating poison man. mushrooms and you're stuff. Right. We'd last like seven hours. You're right. I'd have my pants taped together. <laughs> I'm just sad. kidding. We'd probably do a little better than that. But right, well, hey, at least you got you did beat the rat, though. I beat the rat. And I think that I, I, I could only beat the Olympic swimmer because... I'm running and they're swimming. <laughs> it's like, whatever. That's tough. That's Loser. Tough. Boo. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, got to the thing where you like throw a baseball and see how fast you can throw it. That oh. Fun. 48 and a half miles an hour. Okay. I don't know how fast that is. I want to see you do one of those like not that punching, fast for one actual of those punching picture. things with like the, the speed bag and you slam it. To oh, see that would be like fun. They don't have anything forces. like that at the science museum. But I did get to play against the air hockey robot and I tied it. There I didn't you beat go. it, but my daughter beat it. She lost first, but then she beat it after that. But I feel like it was not like super optimized. It wasn't like, trying its hardest. I don't feel like it was trying that hard. <laughs> so I don't know. It needed some fine tuning. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I tried to get my kids to experience was astronaut ice cream because I have a memory yeah, from my own childhood. Absolutely. They were not having it. What do you mean? They didn't, they tried it and they didn't like it or they didn't no, want to they buy didn't, it? No, they did not even have any interest in trying it. What? Rachel was not into it for one. So oh, I was like, on. I remember this as a kid. She was like, this is a forced memory that you're bringing back. Did they have it though? They had it they there. They had it at the gift they shop? They had it there. It was like an ice cream sandwich, but they were like six bucks a piece. Like it was not cheap. Uh, that's gift it's gift shop like prices. It's like freeze dried. Yeah, it's yeah. gift shop. And I was like, I was like, this is an experience that I had. And, you know, 
Ellie, you gave, Ellie, some- Ellie came over and I was like, yeah, it's like ice cream. I mean, my kids freaking love ice cream. And then she touched kinda, it. She uh, touched it and she was like, no. I'm kind of sad you didn't get some from me. We could have eat, we could be eating some right now. I didn't even we could think be enjoying that. astronaut ice cream on the pencast with our friends Damn. who I'm sure appreciate astronaut what ice cream. You know what? You can get some. I do I, when you take your son I will. back there. You do. I'll reimburse. I will. I'm not just trying to get I'm just, <laughs> I'm not just trying to get some free ice cream no, here. No, I will. Literally didn't cross my mind at the time. I was so thrown off by how like much my kids just I got you, pooped buddy. on this idea like none of them were into it i was like am i in an alternate universe i'm offering them free was it still in the silver cream. bag with the astronaut on it yeah oh come yeah. on i know all right we're gonna make it they happen. were not into it Don't and worry. they were so tired i was like i'm not gonna make them wait while i buy myself ice cream in line i was like <laughs> we're just gonna get out of here oh, so man. anyway that was an experience that's fine and then uh my outdoor adventures I've found a place to put all those piles of logs. Oh, right. I'm burying them. I'm just digging a giant hole and I'm just burying all my logs yeah. so that they can break down into compost. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. That's, that's well, are you going doing. to retrieve them afterwards? No, or? I'm just going to let them break down. Oh, okay. It's probably going to take a few years. It is. That's how I did my yeah. raised bed. Yeah. It's called Hugel culture. Yeah. That's basically what I'm doing, except I'm not trying to plant anything on top of it or whatever. Okay. I'm just... I'm using the earth to insulate and don't you have a lot of clay over there? It's all clay. So you're just going to put them in the clay. I'm just burying it in the clay. You might be preserving them. (laughs) They'll probably be mummified (laughs) in there. So I'll probably do mummified logs in my yard. I don't know what else to do with them, man. I just got logs everywhere. I don't know how much, I don't know how much, um, you know, uh, you know, the the organisms need to break down wood. I don't know how much that's going to penetrate the clay. Uh, I mean, there's gotta be, there's, there's plenty of garbage in the trees already there's like bugs and crap and there's you know i figure you're just gonna kill them all by there's, suffocating there's, there's them something in the there's stuff going on in there uh, let me see if i like have a I, I, if i have a picture to even share with you did you bury them already or you just that's your i'm plan. in the process of burying yeah. them there's a lot of them <laughs> there's a lot of them to bury so i'm working on it uh, what if you're just running around in the woods chopping down trees and putting them down inside of the earth yeah this is about what it's come <laughs> it's to just... I like had a brief conversation <laughs> with Alex here about Hugo culture. And he was like, yeah, you can bury logs in the dirt. And then he said a bunch of other things. And I was like, bury logs in the dirt. I never thought of that. I think that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> that's as far as my thought went is like, what happens after but, that? But I, don't I don't know, but I'm just burying logs. You've in got the dirt. so many, so much woods. Why don't you just like chuck them in the woods? I mean, I could, but it's hard. Their logs are big. And I guess, I guess, you know, I guess if there, are you just going to like bury them where they lie essentially? No, it's like in a corner of my yard that yeah. like I don't don't really mow. This is not a great picture. That looks can... so suspicious, Brian. It looks really sketchy. It that looks, looks like I'm, so. It looks like I'm burying like dead it bodies. It really does. Or it looks like you're there. trying to hide something bad. It does look really suspicious. Like if someone came across you doing that at night, they would take you in for questioning. And that's usually when I'm doing it. Is like as it's getting darker. That is the night. sketchiest thing. What are you doing over there, sir? I'm just burying logs? I'm yeah, burying. sure you are. Burying logs, huh? Come with me. Book them. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to, it's called Hugo culture. I'm burying logs. What did you logs. say? Are you Al-Qaeda? Why are you burying logs? Because I, I didn't want them above the ground. You just want them under the ground. Yeah. So these used to be trees, but you cut them down and now you're burying them? What is wrong with you? <laughs> They're like, I also sell pens. <laughs> like, okay, buddy. You are insane. <laughs> this man's lost it. He's a danger to himself and society. I also sell pens. I sell pens on the internet. Oh, okay, this guy sure clearly this guy's sure lost touch with reality. No one does that, sir. Oh, good. This is not a sound business model. You're speaking oh, nonsense. <laughs> Get in the car, Slick. Get in the car. Oh, my God. I watched Severance 10 times. <laughs> All right, that's enough out of you. That's enough out of you. You've lost. You clearly lost touch with reality, oh, sir. Oh, man. Burying logs in the darkness. Yeah, I just had to share that. This is what it's come to, folks. This is what it's come to. I love that so much. Yep. Oh, man. Yep. This is where we're at. Anyway, uh, that's what's going on in my world. That's marvelous. Yep, indeed. Thank you for I'll that. Keep you updated. Please do. I'll keep you updated. I'd love to know how that goes. I buried like forty of them already. <laughs> I expanded the I expanded the hole. So it was so successful. <laughs> it didn't take me long. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm not like digging it by hand. That would be take forever. I got equipment involved, but anyway. I that make your day. It really does. That make your day. Especially like <laughs> I've already buried 40. Yeah. It's, it was very successful. <laughs> it was very successful. So successful, I expanded. <laughs> I expanded the scope. I'm I was thinking, like, I can fit two log piles like, in there, not one. How could that be unsuccessful? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. 
Short term success has been good. Long term, I successfully I think created a hole and put logs in the hole and covered up the hole. You know, my, you know, it's my biggest fear. What? My biggest fear is that I'm actually creating the perfect like yellow jacket environment. Oh, and it's just going to become like this massive yellow jacket like metropolis. Oh, like metropolis. I really hope that's not the case. And it's going they're just going to chase me out. You're the just going to burn it down. I got my suit. I got my bee suit. You do. I'll take them on. <laughs> I'll go out there at night in my bee suit. Yep. I've also done this. You've done that. With my red light because they can't see the color red. Your nighttime activities I have done all these are things. suspicious in a very unique way. I do. Lo- I guess I am pretty sketchy. It's a good thing I'm <laughs> living in a rural area because otherwise people oh. would call the police on me. They'd be like, this guy is in a bee suit walking around outside burying logs in the dirt. There's probably a satellite that's on you. Just I'm sure. I'm Thanks. sure somebody's somebody's watching me. Oh my god, I'm crying. Yep. Oh, Just look at my search history for all this pen cast oh. stuff. People are like, what is this guy doing? There's no way this is, you know, legit. Anyway, <laughs> that's it for personal stuff. <laughs> Let's go a couple of co- co- blah, 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 blah. cover a couple of company updates and then we'll get out of here. Oh. Well, we have one video this week. The pocket pen guide with drew i think it could, i think the prayer is in there isn't it the prayer is in there is that why prayer is on your mind maybe it is yeah yeah yep. okay. i was thinking about the prayer so i'm like a this more. is a great pen we don't talk, talk about, about it much more. yeah there you go. well if you want to learn about the prayer uh, and other pocket pens go check out drew's video because we got that one published and find out what the smallest fountain pen we have is Can it's probably guess? not what you think Ooh, good, good. Uh, number five will surprise you. That's right. <laughs> Doctors hate number three. <laughs> number 13 will shock you. <laughs> You'll never guess the last one. Because it's not 13. Um, There's anyway. not that many pens. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we'll keep videos coming. And uh, yeah, that's all we got. Um, let's wrap this sucker up, shall we? Well, we want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us some questions. Leave us some comments. Leave Drew some comments because he doesn't want them. And uh, you should give it to You can talk anyway. to me as much as you want as you do not contradict my objective cheese superiority <laughs> declaration. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, check out gulaypens.com for fountain pen ink. Uh, fountain pen, comma, ink, and paper needs. That's how you do it. Uh, like and subscribe, YouTube, Instagram, all these things. And I got a fun fact for you, Drew. Lay it on me. Because I was researching. Phil- 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 how do you say this again? Philately? Sure. The stamp collecting. Okay, yes. Stamp and postage. Postage collecting, whatever. Okay. So the first postage stamps for the prepayment of letter postage were issued in England in 1840. Everybody knows that. They were the brainchild of Roland Hill, who successfully proposed them in his pamphlet Post Office Reform in 1837. Postal charges were then determined mainly by the distance traveled and the weight of the letter. But... Hill proved that the main cost of transport was in the handling and sorting of letters rather than in their carriage. Hill further observed that because most letters went through post unpaid at the time and postage had to be collected from the recipient upon delivery, many of them were refused and had to be returned, thus necessitating a two-way trip for no revenue. Sounds very inefficient. Hill proposed a radical change that all postage be prepaid and that letters be carried by any distance within Great Britain for a fixed rate. Hence, the stamp. That's, that's actually where it kind of came about. That's a great idea. Pretty novel. Roland Hill isn't had it? to travel across the Roland Hills. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot more to this article, and it gets pretty boring if you're not into stamps. Why couldn't you talk but, about coins? I like coins. Um, I feel like stamps. you knew know a lot about coins. And then... I, I tried to collect stamps in middle school. Yeah. One of my mom's friends There's had like... so many. One of my mom's friends was like into stamps and I kind of like... I got like... I'm, I'm one of those I people... I can see the appeal. Yeah, yeah, I can see the appeal. I can see the appeal in like any collection. Sure. Like, it's not hard. And so I was like, oh, that sounds cool. This is cool. And, but as soon as I got like a book to like actually start collecting them, I lost interest. It was... Mm. Very boring to me. See, I like pens because you can do something with them. I like collecting things that you can do stuff with. Like yeah. stamps, you can't. I mean, you can mail things. Well, I like things. coins because, you know, there's that historic element to it. Like, um, I mean, same with stamps. You get the historic element with stamps, too. Not not all the time. What do we got here? This is, oh, this is an interesting one. So this one is um, from New Zealand. This is a half crown um, back when um, um, George V was the uh, monarch there, or the emperor in this case. But you've got some cool, like, Maori-style, um, like, 
demon dragon face things on hmm. the coin itself. So you've got a little bit, of course, you know, they were, you know, a colony at the time, but they still had some cultural stuff in there. So like that, like there's, there's iconography there yeah. that tells you a little bit about the time. So yeah. for me, I like history. I think that's fascinating. So, yeah. and coins are especially like, you know, coins with monarchs on them. Mm. They are indicative of that time, like very visually. For sure. Stamps like, you know, oh, look, here's an Elvis stamp from 93, like, I mean, Elvis yeah, wasn't alive there. So, well, there's like a lot of commemorative things. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, like coins like have that educational element to them. That's fair. Um, That's which, fair. which I like. And I like to find out like cool things that happen in cool years. And like if this one year was really cool, I want to get a coin from that year because that's the year Franz Ferdinand was assassinated or something like that. So, that's true. And, st- and there's like life, to, I mean, they're more durable. Goods, yeah. And so also, like, you got to wonder like 1933, like what did this buy back in New Zealand? Probably like, a lot of different things. Like, that's so cool to me. Like, and and somehow it, it's come into my possession. Now I'm holding it. And how it's... many people have gone to the bathroom and not washed their hands? Right. And touched that coin. Like it's amazing. Amazing. And now my <laughs> dirty hands have been on it. So right. Hooray, you know, I'm just you got one, it in your pocket. I'm, I'm one. I'm You're one touching it all day. In a long, distinguished line of grimy paws. Yeah. 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 It's uh, something to be proud of. Do you want to touch my coin? I think I'm good. <laughs> I think I'm good. But. I'll see you here next week. hey Thanks, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you later. Right on. Awesome. I had a different fun fact that I realized that I forgot to include. Because I had one last week that I was going to save, and then I forgot that I was saving it. So I'll save it for next week. Makes unless sense. I forget, which I will. Bah, humbuggington.